And I was hoping, hoping that I could make two to three hundred extra dollars a week. If I could do that, then I would be comfortable. And I thought that was a little overzealous. Probably not going to happen. It didn't take very long with with the big good business practices that I implemented for this to just blow up. Within six months, I was bringing in twenty one thousand dollars a week. A year later, it was fifty thousand a week, and then by the end, we were Sales. doing over a hundred thousand a week. You know, there was a couple months when I did half a million in a week. It was crazy. So, what what did eventually do you in? How did the empire crumble? Vigorous podcast with Vigor Steve and Ryan Root, who at one point in time was the biggest steroid dealer in the United States. And you did your time, right? Yes, so sir. So you can basically talk about everything that happened yep. back in the day and, and yep. what's going on currently. Thanks for coming on, man. It's a pleasure. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, it's an honor to talk to you as well. I, um, I and thousands of people appreciate what you're doing. Like you've, you've really helped normalize the conversation and and increase the the general education level yeah um thank you you know within people everywhere when when i was coming up we didn't have this we had like lou wellen's book no. <laughs> and that was about it right so we just had to yeah it, in in forums and and people writing on forums so so the the education you're, you you're helping thousands upon thousands or so hundreds of thousands of people yeah and i appreciate yeah. that and i know other people do thank too. you so so um thank you Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, I realized this after I went to the United States uh, and, and met people right, who watch it. Because if you're hiding away in Thailand, you don't really meet the people. And most of the people here, they don't watch my channel because they'd rather just ask me in the gym. So I'm the gym bro <laughs> for all those guys. <laughs> but yeah, I realized when I, after those two trips to the USA that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's making a pretty big difference. So that's cool. So I'm, yeah. I'm just giving back what I wish I had, like you said. You know, yeah. the, back in the day, we didn't have this kind of knowledge. And you would get some information from your steroid dealer um, mm -hmm. who, who you hoped knew a little bit more than you did and the yeah. forums. And, and again, uh, Anabolics 10th, 11th edition, you know, which I now slowly have debunked. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> With yeah. my videos, yeah. or at least the anabolics, androgenic rating, and, and a couple other things in that book. But yeah. and that was the best source of information at that time. Sure. So so back in the day, like, you know, besides a couple of forums, like Intense Muscle and, uh, man, what, what Muscle Mayhem, and, and which other forums did you guys use to frequent back in the day? Um, um, now I have to go back and remember. Uh, like, like <laughs> I think the, the Mezzo Forum was pretty big. And uh, yeah. Um, just like there was even something called like steroids.com that had profiles of all the drugs. Yeah. Um, that's why I started learning first. Yeah. Right. So it was just, you know, especially when, when I first tried testosterone in my early twenties, um, I had such a dramatic improvement in quality of life that, that I had to know, like, what was this? And I happened to be in, in college for biochemistry at the time. Oh, okay. so. So I kind of started tailoring my degree to the study of this because like, you know, I guess starting to get into, into the story and what, what mm -hmm. made me so passionate about this is I now know that I had low testosterone my whole life. Like, um, mm -hmm. you know, back then tw 20 years ago or over 20 years ago, when I was in my twenties, the medical community wouldn't even test somebody in their twenties. They wouldn't even test mm -hmm. you for testosterone. They're like, there's, they said, there's no way that anyone in their twenties could have low testosterone. So we're not even, we're not even going to look at it or consider it. Right. So, um, so like now, again, now I know that I had low testosterone because just, you know, I had all the symptoms like, and, and mm. back then we used to just call people lazy, right? You're lazy or, <laughs> or you have bad genetics or whatever. And, right. you know, we put these, these other terms on it when, when, uh, you know, people aren't inherently lazy, like, you know, people are supposed to be motivated and, and want to do things. And, and like one of the reasons like you could have somebody who's always tired or who seems lazy and never really, it, you know, one of the major things that that could be is low hormones and low hormones could be at any age, right? It's not, you know, mm -hmm. just like anybody can be diabetic. Uh, um, anybody, you know, any age can have thyroid conditions. Anyone can have low testosterone too. So, right. um, so, you know, when I finally tried testosterone in my early 20s, it, I mean, the I just hyper responded and the it was a dramatic improvement. I mean, I lived two different worlds, two different lives, one before testosterone, mm -hmm. one after. And I was it was, I mean, so amazing um, the world after that. Uh, that, you know, I 
I had to know about it. I had, so I started reading voraciously. And again, I bought Llewellyn's book. Uh, I, and, and the other was just reading on all these forums, like steroids.com, just right. reading as much as you get and taking in that information. And then, you know, as you know, too, like as you start to experience it and, and, and aggregate the empirical data from just watching people, other people and yourself go through this, you start to realize that a lot of that information wasn't exactly correct. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So a, it's a like, lot, a lot of anecdotal experience and, and extrapolating, you know, yeah. from animal models and, and, and usually the scientific evidence wasn't even investigated. They would just make it's, stuff it's right. up. And, yeah, and that comes from, you know, the fact that it became a controlled substance in the 1990 steroid control act. Right. And yeah. that, and mm -hmm. it being banned in um, the Olympic committee and in sports, it just guarded the stigma, right? So I've always said it followed a similar path to marijuana, right? Where in the 1950s or possibly even before that, there was something called reefer madness where marijuana oh, was yeah. demonized, right? And they, uh -huh. they actually educated you that if you smoked marijuana, you could die, that you, um, uh, that you could go, you would go crazy if you smoked it. And yeah, it and kill awful. people. Yeah, I, rem I remember those propaganda videos. Yeah, right. So I had the stigma attached to it, and you can scare anybody about anything if you just inculcate them with this misinformation, right? Yeah. Like we mm -hmm. could scare our whole society, our whole society about bananas if if we wanted, if we just taught right. them that they were evil and bad and awful things would happen. So it's like, and it took almost six decades for that stigma to for for marijuana for that stigma to abate. Right. Uh -huh. um, you know, before people started realizing, you know what, marijuana is not that dangerous. In fact, it has a lot of benefits for a lot of people. There's a lot of medical benefits. And I believe testosterone is following a similar path. It's just behind it. Right. So way, way behind. I mean, it's yeah. only over the last couple of years that, that at least America is accepting some TRT clinics. Yeah. But then on the other hand, they're banning peptides just recently. And then yeah. right, Oxandrin, Oxandrolone is, is being pulled. So we'll, we'll get yeah. into all of that. Yeah. And uh, uh, of course, the current administration is very anti-steroids. Uh, I mean, the guy in power is yeah. uh, was one of the guys behind the Steroid Control Act. Yeah. yeah it's um, so again, you know, vote a little bit better. The, the yeah. election year is coming up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what vote it comes down to. a little better, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, but so so the, it becoming a controlled substance made it difficult, if not impossible, to study and and yeah, and humans especially, right? So so that's why there's such a lack of knowledge and understanding. I mean, that's one of the reasons the stigma, the inability to research it on humans because it's a controlled substance. Like it just, mm -hmm. you know, that that's what makes the entire medical community the um, yeah, so far behind, right? Like the medical community yeah, it's, is light years behind the bodybuilding community and understanding these compounds true. strictly from experience and, and empirical empirical and anecdotal data. And you can also see it in scientific literature. There's a lot of scientific evidence that goes up to like the mid 80s and mm -hmm. then it has a steep decline. Yeah. So most of the stuff that we interpret is actually before the Steroid Control Act. Yeah. And then after that, it has a lot to do with doping or um, as a feed efficiency right, trimbolone feed efficiency yeah. for cattle yeah. or boldenone feed efficiency for uh, other animals like broiler chicks or whatever. So you have a lot of animal studies that are, you know, performed in animals that are being uh, eaten eventually, yeah, right. but mm -hmm. not so much new uh, data on the forefront. So basically all we can pull from is, is studies that are decades old. Yes. That's right. Decades. And, and, and the studies <laughs> this, are... This is what we're taking, you know? Yeah. And the studies, if you read them too, like the studies are, are um, you know, especially, you know, a lot of the studies come from, they are biased, even though they say that, oh, this is an unbiased viewpoint. The study, mm -hmm. like a lot of the studies, you know, meant intended to understand it for humans are biased to, to towards the stigma, towards their biased towards proving that these steroids are dangerous and they can cause problems. And well, yeah, I agree. So I just did an Anavar deep dive looking at what is the best dose, right? For with the medical uh, data and, and see what higher dose just could do to humans. And then I think I must've read like a hundred studies on Oxandrolone. Yeah. And in a lot of the abstracts, they mention that higher dosages of Oxandrolone are, are used in sports. It's considered mm -hmm. doping. It's considered illegal. It's not supposed to be that way. Yeah. But in the context of this study in Kleinfelter syndrome, 
right, or, or whatever yeah. disease, disease yeah. XYZ, they're going to investigate what the proper dose of oxandrolone is. So they, they this this bias is definitely there in the medical field where they always mention that you know, these are being used illicitly. Yeah. But for the purpose of this study, we're trying to investigate some sort of new medical application. And that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty concerning. But, you know, this is just, you know, I, I'm sure all these researchers just have to put it in there because the stigma is there and the control acts are there and, and they're controlled substances. Um, so if they don't put it in there, then it might sound like they're glorifying, you know, drug but, use, which is yeah. basically what my YouTube channel is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, yeah, you're right. And, you know, another problem is that the, again, the the scientific community doesn't really understand these. There there was a, a study, I, I don't remember mm -hmm. when, but there was a study that the final conclusion was that t there's no evidence that testosterone increases muscle mass. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's many studies like this. Yeah. yeah. Many so you, like you, like, they've never talked to a bodybuilder or never, like, seen yeah. <laughs> or watched a bodybuilding contest. Like, uh -huh. like you, you know, th there's a disconnect between the scientific community and what, you know, what the bodybuilding community knows to be true. And, right. um, and, and so th therefore, um, uh, there wasn't a distinction made between bodybuilding doses and therapeutic doses, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of the studies would come out and say, okay, here's some studies, here's some evidence of people using these abusive doses. Um, and it caused all these problems. Therefore, this drug, nandrolone, testosterone, whatever it may be, causes mm -hmm. these conditions, right? But, but the study was on this person who was using abusive doses for decades, you know? Right. And, and so these studies haven't been resolved to make that distinction. Here's, yes, abusive doses can do this, but here's therapeutic doses. And these right. therapeutic doses do not, you know, cause near the problems that, that the abuse have been, you know, again. So it was just, you know, all of that was conflated. All that information is just conflated to, to come out and say, anabolic steroids in general are just bad for you. They cause all these problems. Yeah, and, and it could be a hidden agenda there that it has to do with the demasculinization of society. Right? Because, of course, anabolic androgenic steroids are obviously masculinizing. Mm -hmm. um, and now with the shift in the tone, um, maybe this is just one of those underlying things that they don't want to empower people to feel good again by using these at therapeutic dosages or for sports in general. Um, and, and thus they want to take it away. But, of course, it's only in the United States. Like in other countries, like in Thailand, for example, it's not really a big deal. Yeah. It's not really a big deal, and in other countries as well, you know. So, yeah, and there's not, it, it, and this is the thing: like, there's not people going crazy with these anabolic steroids and and dying left and right because it's because mm -hmm. it's legal, right? Like, I have this like I have a feeling that that's what the government seems to think, or or people who are who do agree with that stigmatization of these compounds, they think that oh, if we legalize this, all of a sudden there's just going to people running around, you know, giant people running around having heart attacks and and die yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, and that's just not how it works that's not <laughs> you know no i know uh, yeah it must be the 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 senality of uh, some of the, the the governors and and the people who make executive decisions on these kinds of things because when you start researching the names and then you do the date of birth you see that all these guys are 70 plus years old yeah right <laughs> yeah it, and so, there, yeah so there might be a little bit biased you know <laughs> That's absolutely correct. And th there yeah. is, there seems to be a, a cultural thing, um, you know, depending on the demographic, like you're, like you're indicating, like, for mm -hmm. instance, you know, in my TRT clinic, I thought when I started this, that we'd have a lot of people in forties, fifties, maybe even sixties, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. those are the people who would probably be needed the most. Right. But, but there is, there's a, most of our clients are 20s to 30s. Like the highest percentage yeah. of our clients are 20s to 30s, then 30s to 40s, and we only have a few people over 50. Like yeah. it's and it's this it's this mentality with this older, the older generation. These are the people who need it would probably benefit from it the most. They right. need it the most, yeah. But besides the young guys that are, of course, also androgen deficient, like Stan yeah. Efferding, for example, he had a varicose cell both sides, I think, mm -hmm. for for many years, and he didn't even go through puberty fully. And then at one point he ended up like you on, on hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. And then it did the world open up and he turned out to be one of the strongest bodybuilders and, and, you know, competitive bodybuilders on the planet, yeah. strong man and doing all that stuff. But he, he needed it medically. 
Yeah. And then later on, he got his varicose cell fixed and he, he was able to conceive a couple children. But that was later on in life after using steroids for many years. Yeah. So, you know, you're an example. Stan mm-hmm. Efferdin is, is an example. And I've talked to hundreds of guys in their early 20s who have similar issues. Oh, yeah. And they need testosterone medically, right? Mm-hmm. And that's after trying all the things that we now know could be beneficial, like yeah. improving your sleep quality, eating better, reducing mm-hmm. stress, blah, blah, blah. I stopped masturbating so much uh, because of social media, all these little things that could contribute. And at one point you, you come to a point where you might need it medically. And luckily, mm-hmm. at least in the United States and some other countries, there's now some TRT clinics to help with that. Mm-hmm. But it's the older demographic, like you mentioned, the, the 50 years old and the six year olds that, I don't know, it, it's, it's like not part of their world and, and they don't do research and they don't, yeah. under, they don't put the connection, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's. It's really interesting. I, I didn't expect that. Uh, it's really interesting. Yeah. And, and you know, again, so back when when I was in my 20s, they wouldn't even test somebody for testosterone. And that, that, the, you know, the, the overwhelming yeah. idea was that nobody in their 20s could possibly be low on testosterone. So therefore, we're not even going to consider it. So therefore, you know, there's several factors that, that are now proving that younger people, there's a lot of younger people who have, you know, mm-hmm. low testosterone. Um, and... It, some of this comes from, well, we didn't collect the empirical and anecdotal data back 20 years ago because we wouldn't even test anybody. We weren't even considering that it was a possibility. So how many people were yeah. in their 20s that had low testosterone back 20, 30, 40 years ago? But but we just, you know, the medical community just ignored it. Um, to, well, I mean, look look in the 70s, see how many lanky dudes were there, you know, yeah, in the right. Woodstock Festival. <laughs> is, that, can, is that LSD and weed or is that maybe low yeah. testosterone? <laughs> you can look at, yeah, like, you know, once you've been doing this for a while, you can look at somebody and see that they need testosterone. And and you're right. Like, you can mm-hmm. look at old pictures of people in the 70s, like, wow, that guy needs some testosterone. Yeah. Um, and, and at that time, we already had the action movies with the masculine, you know, bodybuilders that was already becoming popular. The Mr. Olympia was there. Uh, what is it? Steve Reeves and Ray, Reg Park. They were in the movies. Yeah, right? somewhat muscular, so they were exposed to this kind of stuff. Um, maybe even more than we are now, because now everything is feminized. Yeah, even Marvel, <laughs> the MCU. Uh, yeah. So, so, so you know, when you look back at those pictures, you're like you know, I think, I think there were more men with low testosterone and. I know a lot of guys that undergo their post cycle therapy, they have this dip, right, of low testosterone, and they, mm-hmm. they feel like they're missing something. And guess what? A lot of these guys start resulting to recreational drugs to fill that hole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there might be some sort of, a, you know, some sort of reasoning there that a lot of guys, they feel that they're deficient in something. They don't put it together that it's testosterone. And then, of course, you know, it's probably more likely that you get into a scenario where weeds and other drugs are being offered to you than, hey, bro, you know, I think you need to test your testosterone. Here's a file of tests in case you're low. Right? That's very unlikely. That only yeah. happens in the gyms. But the gyms, of course, the gym population is just a very small community. Yeah. Uh, and and even back then, I mean, testosterone wasn't even available. You had methyl testosterone, yeah. nandrolone, and dianabol. Yeah. <laughs> That, yeah, and that's, that's what a lot of the, the younger people that don't understand is how hard it was to get to get testosterone or or anything, you know, back yeah. twenty five years ago. It was like it was really hard. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I think like in, in Arnold's days, they they ran Nandrolone and Dianabol simply because that was the only thing that's available. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, like pharmaceutical testosterone. I mean, was available, but it was not as readily available as, as some of the other things. So, so you know, running a nandrolone only cycle is that, just pure necessity. That's exactly right. So, like, it was difficult to get these things. This is what the younger people don't understand because it's so easy to get anything now, right? Oh, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but the but back then it was it was really hard to get. And just like you're saying, so you would you would take whatever you got your hands on. So. Yeah. Um, if, if you could get your hands on DECA, then you just took DECA. And, and that's, the, you know, that's, is also where the, the myth and legend of DECA dick, you know, really came to be because people were taking nandrolone only cycles, having erectile dysfunction and saying, oh, this nandrolone causes this when, when, yeah, it does when it's by itself for some people. Right. But, mm-hmm. uh, but when properly blended with testosterone, we don't see that problem. Yeah, unless you, unless you let your estrogen and prolactin levels really go sky high, and aromatized inhibitors is also something that is from the eighties, yeah, eighties, eighty, eighty six. I think 
Uh, first we had Mastro and it was discontinued yes. because aromatized yeah. inhibitors and Novidex and stuff became yeah. available and, and then Mastro was uh, discontinued for uh, estrogen positive breast cancer. Yeah. So at, at one point in that time, these steroids had some sort of medical application, but then they realized that they were inherently virilizing or causing side effects. And then they went to other medications to replace that. And that, mm -hmm. that of course, limits the availability. Um, and now there's not much left. And you got Test, Primo, Nandrolone, Anivar, Winstrol, Halotest, and Anadrol. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. And the rest <laughs> is all underground labs. So, yeah. so... Tell me how you got started in this um, like underground lab scene back in the day. Like, okay. what, what is your slow transition into that scene? Okay, yeah, uh, I, I just want to go back to one thing that you were saying too, sure. um, just to to um, extend your point. When you said that a lot of these guys, you know, have low testosterone and then they're taking other drugs to kind of fill that void or fill a fill a possibly a dopamine void, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I see that all the time, like in my, especially in my clinic or in, in everything where, um, people, people are able to take testosterone and probably because it's dopaminergic in and of itself, that I'm they're sure. able to easier come off of other drugs. I've, I've seen, yeah. I've seen people come off of all kinds of drug habits, even opioids. And, and because, you know, it is a steroid, there is some anti-inflammatory nature to testosterone, especially nandrolone. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen people be able to come off pain medications, you know, yeah. from this. So, so it's exactly what you're saying is proving to be true. Like, you know, you see it all over the place. Well, you, you see it in the medical literature also that, that testosterone is actually able to resolve all kinds of medical conditions. If it's a therapeutic dose, like uh, diabetes, yeah. insulin yeah. resistance, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I see uh, depression uh, at, at various see, yeah. doses. I, I recently, uh, you know, reviewed some of the studies on testosterone. Mm -hmm. and you see that this, it resolves condition after condition after yeah. condition. And then uh, I'm sure it could resolve addiction to a certain extent yeah. also, because it is, it does increase dopamine levels. Yeah. And again, if you're chasing a dopamine high with drugs like Adderall or anything else, um, yeah. I'm sure you can replace that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that's, that's bioidentical true. and and ten times healthier. Yeah, absolutely, and I see it all the time too. Like people coming off of uh, blood pressure medications, cholesterol medications, SSRIs, uh, mm -hmm. again pain medications, even opiates such as heroin and everything. Like I, you see it all the time. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get started with this with this steroid business? Okay, um, so as I stated, I, you know, I had low testosterone. I now know, mm -hmm. know that like I, um, I was always tired. I, I didn't develop like my peers. Um, mm -hmm. it seemed like I, I had to put in twice the amount of work to get half the results uh, as all my peers. Um, I, you know, I was not confident. I didn't have like the, you know, the aggressiveness in sports. Um, so, so I, I, you know, I was kind of, uh, I don't know, almost walked on when I was younger. I wasn't really really respected just because I, you know, again, I didn't, I didn't have that, you know, that sense of confidence or sense of well-being. Right. So again, one time, one day I decided to start taking testosterone and it was a dramatic improvement, like everything from confidence to energy to, and I put on about 30 pounds in, in a oh, hundred yeah. pounds on my bench in about five weeks. Like I just hyper responded and it, it like, it was just yeah. a completely different world. So again, I had that's to, all the muscle that you should have had, right? Yeah, right. right. That's all the muscle that you should have had at that age. That's <laughs> you that just was, because you went. Uh, uh, what did you start with? Like two hundred tests, hundred fifty tests. It was a small dose. I was taking. Yeah, I was taking. I started off with two hundred and fifty milligrams of sus, one milliliter sus a week, and mm -hmm. uh, ten milligrams of debo. That's that's what okay. I started off with, and I just. Yeah. I mean, I just blew, blew up. The fuck up. Yeah, yeah, it was it was crazy. But but you're right. It was I looked more like my work ethic because I I used to spend two, you know, two two and a half hours in the gym every day, sometimes double sessions. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't looking at I, you know, some of my friends could you know just go a couple times a week and be stronger and look better than I did. Right. And now I look like my work ethic. Like I actually, you know, I had like I identified like the I identified as a bodybuilder and I didn't look like one, but now I did. Right. So yeah. it was just like a totally different world. And, and you know, it, it's also the a lot of people don't talk about this as being one of the benefits of testosterone and these androgens. 
but like um people just looked at me differently right now people mm -hmm. wanted to befriend me just because of my impressive stature i would walk into a bar and the part the, the crowd would part in front of me or yeah that's the exact same thing I would fucking notice when I went on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> the exact same mm -hmm. thing. I, I went on a cycle. I gained like 10 pounds because I was trading natural for like 11 years. So I was yeah. pushing towards my natural limit. Maybe I could have gained five, five, 10 more pounds or something. Yeah. And, uh, but that would have taken five, five to 10 years. Yeah. So I was 26. Exactly. I went on cycle. I gained like five to 10 pounds in a couple of weeks. Right. And then you walk through the city and see a group of like, you know, hoodlums basically. Yeah. And you're, Right when you're ready to take a step to the sides, they just scatter. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. You yeah. know, like 12 dudes just, just splitting apart. I'm like, yeah. oh, we'll just go through the middle then. That, that, I guess that's, that's exactly what it's right. going to be now. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, that's dopaminergic in and of itself. Right. So that makes yeah. you feel mm -hmm. good. And, and you can see it. Like when you walk into a room, when I'm, you know, when I started doing this, when you'd walk into a room and you can see the heads turn, you know, to, mm -hmm. to look and you see that you like, we take these very small social cues, um, mm -hmm. you know, as signs of respect uh, or admiration. And that's dopaminergic. That makes you feel good. And especially a compliment. So now, like, now you're like people, every time you meet somebody new, almost they're like, holy cow, like, you know, look at you. That, and, yeah, and, uh, and those compliments are massively dopaminergic. And it feels good. And when you're in your early when you're in your early twenties and you just have come from a background where you don't feel so confident and you don't feel so masculine and strong, and then that's even more of a difference, right? If you do it at a later age and your personality is already set in, then I, I don't think it's gonna be that much of a difference. But you know, especially when you're young, you know, fuck now it now it sounds like everybody young should go on TRT. No, yeah, right. That's <laughs> that's not what we're saying. How do I grow my beard? Yeah. <laughs> You should see my inbox. Can I take train to grow my beard? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, though. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't yeah. grow any facial hair until after I started. Like I was in my twenties and I couldn't grow facial hair. Same, same, same. Yeah. Now it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, it migrates like to your back. And <laughs> yeah, it goes from here just yeah to the back and take off the sweater. So that's not yeah. a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you started feeling a lot better at that age yeah. and you felt more confident and uh, yes. you came a bit into your own. Yes. Yeah, so, like some of those little things, I think it's important, especially, you know, people who, who need testosterone, it's important, like, you know, especially in our, like in our society, especially with the, the medical community, like um, people don't like to admit that part of the benefit of taking testosterone is the, the, inc the, the increase in aesthetic appearance or, or the the physique change, right? And that's a big mm -hmm. part of feeling good. When when you start looking better and people comment on that, you see people, oh, you look good. You look like you've been working out. Like those things are massively dopaminergic. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a For sure. part of the benefit. It's a part of the sense of well being that comes mm -hmm. from it. And and I think like we live again, it's been inculcated into us that no, you don't use these for for muscle building, you know, because we're not allowed to prescribe these compounds to build muscle, right? You, you can, you, it can be prescribed for a symptom can be, um, inability to gain muscle mass or inability to maintain mm -hmm. muscle mass, but it can't be to, to build muscle. Like you can't take it to build muscle. Like it can't yeah, be or, or, that reason, right? Yeah. Some sort of muscle wasting, but then you have to have cancer or yeah. HIV or, or, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, burns or 50% of your body. And so that's, it's hard to get prescribed. So yeah, I'm going to get myself some HIV so I can get some Prima Ball yeah, and right. and testosterone like, prescribed and, 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 and yeah. GH, right. I get the full Monty on prescription. Yeah. No. So, and, and of course, like the doctors, they don't really want to lose their medical license. And, and most of the endocrinologists are not trained in hormones. That was maybe one semester. That's exactly They're correct. trained in diabetes. That's exactly right? the, the pancreas. But, that, those it, endocrine hormones, they understand, but the pituitary and the testicles. No, the, the, you're like exactly a, correct. A, a little cha a cliff note in the chapter on the last page of the book. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to say it's like we have this machine, right, that we put medical students in and not, we spit a provider out on the other side. Now, there's some differing um focuses depending on your specialty but in that whole paradigm none of it teaches about testosterone about these hormones testosterone estrogen hormone you know these these hormones mm -hmm. like you said it's uh insulin a lot of insulin and diabetes nothing mm -hmm. hardly anything about these and the information that they do have that they do learn is antiquated notions and dogma from decades ago 
right? Yeah, and yeah. and stigmatized information, right? So and the, so the funny thing is, like most of the really good, knowledgeable guys on hormone replacement therapy and steroids in general that are doctors are not endocrinologists. Oh right? yeah, Doctor Todd Lee. There, right? yeah. Not, there, not, yeah. I don't think it's it's trade. You had an interest in it, but I mean, what, what a, he is a gyne gynecologist, right? Yeah. Or that was part of his things. Yeah. And you have Dr. Andrew Wing, who is a general practitioner, yeah. uh, but work, mostly works in the ER. He has his own TRT clinic as well. Dr. Adam Hotchkiss, yeah. basically a foot doctor. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. Um, and all these guys are highly knowledgeable when yeah. it comes to anabolic androgenic steroids and, and hormone replacement and everything that goes along with optimizing male uh, health and, and performance. Uh, but they're not, you know, they didn't uh, learn traditionally any of that trained. Yeah. No, they didn't learn it in yeah, school. They, it <laughs> they, yeah. they had an interest. They yeah, had, they had an interest in it. Right. So, I mean, so, so that's got to be the understanding. Like it, it. You know, as much as I've seen this, as I've seen like uh, the you know your average primary care physician or or even endocrinologist just botch this and and display a, a massive misunderstanding of these hormones, it, I still get surprised. I, like when people come to me and and say, "Oh yeah, my." my my doctor said this you know about yeah. about my levels or something you know people who needed to come to come to me to get treated i, I just um it's still i still get angry and almost it blows my mind about the lack of understanding uh, yeah all, all you can do is just provide a better surface and then at one point it will snowball right i mean yeah, right. america health how, how popular they've become over the last two years yeah. i mean they're just filling a gap and and, and you're filling a gap and yeah. andrew wingy is is filling a gap and there's there's a couple you know select TRT places or or meal optimization places where where people do understand, and I, I think over the next five to ten years, endocrinologists for for TRT prescriptions will no longer exist. They'll just go to a meal health optimization clinic. Yeah, no, just like yeah. just like women go to the clinic to get Botox and filler and all that stuff, and men go <laughs> go yeah. there just to get their prescriptions filled. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it just takes, you're right. it takes time. It is it even. Takes time. Even in the time that I was in prison, like when I got out, mm -hmm. because of people like yourself and other influencers, mm -hmm. um, the general education was significantly better. And like, yeah. like my sentence was six and a half years. I did a little over four of that. Um, you know, I got some mm -hmm. good time and some programs that got me some time off. So I did a little over four years. And even in that, like four and a half years. Mm -hmm. um the general education level was a lot higher when i got out and i was happy to see that i was happy to see like okay yeah. you know what when i was when i was running that operation like people would come to me and i would have to guide people through this and that's how i mm -hmm. i aggregated all my empirical data is i you know i had over twenty thousand clients and i was helping helping them helping a hundred a day guiding through them yeah getting them through exactly you know what to do and i was receiving blood work and 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 empirical okay. data back that i could now see and i could just see this on a vast level i could stand on my mountaintop and look down at all this data that i had been just receiving on, on guiding all these people um mm -hmm. and you know it was just invaluable education um yeah especially i mean i i coached for like 12 years give or take maybe a little yeah. bit longer and then in that period, you, you help so many people. I think I've seen thousands of blood works as well. And then you realize that, you know, it's, it's of course, the, the interplay of pharmacology is a little bit more complicated than yeah. just steroids, right? Because yeah. bodybuilders just don't only take steroids. They take, you know, fat burners and growth hormone and insulin and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But you see that it's, you know, with some health management in place, it's actually quite doable, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with some outliers here and there. And uh, yeah, it, it allows you to collect a, a boatload of information that most of the doctors don't have. And that's why they'd rather come to me or you. Yeah, that's exactly right. the doctor, they don't really understand what's going on. And oh, my creatinine is elevated. You have kidney failure. No, no. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. yeah <laughs> it's yeah, not right. what's We're... going on. Liver enzymes are elevated. My liver yeah. is failing. No, yeah. that's not what's going yeah. on, right? So or your, your hematic I mean, credits. 51 yeah. you have to you have to donate blood and you and yeah you, you have to donate blood, blood yeah just die. like it's yeah. <laughs> drink a little bit more water and yeah chill out <laughs> yeah <laughs> all these things yeah it's uh it, it, it's funny so so you've been so you were selling steroids and then also guiding these people on how to use them at the same time weren't you like e answering emails like 18 hours a day i i was it, i worked about 12 <laughs> to 15 hours a day um and 
you know, I, I had built the business so so that well, I, I can get in that a little bit. You know what? <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to go chronologically so so that it's a more oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> cogent story. I can go I can go back to where it started. So, anyways, I you know, again, I I, I have such a life changing revelation from taking uh, testosterone. I was in school for biochemistry at the time. I started tailoring my degree um, to mm -hmm. the study of hormones. And, uh, and I just read voraciously. And so pretty soon I'm able to start helping people locally. Like I can just, um, you know, I start nailing down some supply chains just, you know, for myself and some buddies and, and then other people are coming to me saying like, how are you doing? You know, how do you look like, like that? Like, you know, can you help me? So I just started helping people just here and there. And then after some time I, I was do, I started, it started to become like, you know, this is the guy to go to if you want to look and feel your best. So I started to realize I had to monetize this because it was uh, right. it was starting to take some time, and you know, and, and I realized that I had I had a skill here. See what you've done here, Steve. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Just play. That's how it should be. Come on, buddy. Come on. <laughs> just fine. Just uh, just right. stick your stick your head out, let's your hand out, and do it like this for ten minutes, and then yeah. we're done. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I started helping people and I, I realized I had to monetize it. So I started, you know, more, more so nailing down supply chains and, 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 um, you know, and just monetizing this. Uh, so mm -hmm. one day, uh, I, as I said, I got, I don't know if we should, we should go into the, the history of, of some of the, the dealers at this time, but, um, yeah, just don't name drop. But you can you can hint. Well, not dealers. I meant. I'm, I'm sorry. These this the um brand the names right the name names of some of the biggest labs at the time. Yeah, I didn't mean. Dealers. Oh no, that's fine. Those I would are never up, disclose sure. the name of a of a specific dealer yeah. or or, or yeah. any specific client that I ever sold. I would never. That would be unethical. I wouldn't do that. But, no, um, no, the name the, the brand names are fine because I'm sure somebody in the audience will recognize. Hey, wait a minute! I used that lab and it was fucking good. Yeah, yeah, right. So. <laughs> I got this, um, uh, I got this source just from a, just from a friend and it turned out to be this amazing source. This was IP China and we'll, we'll yeah. talk more about them, uh, in a little bit, but I got this source and there, there, it was a, it was actually an incredible source. It was probably one of the better, better sources in the world at this time. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I started ordering from them for you know a bunch of our buddies. And then, you know, I had a little operation going, so I would, I would get stuff from people and, over time, I just started building up, um, you know, volume and just just recognition, the name recognition. And I would start talking to the, the, these guys, and I was able to just keep getting my price down. Like I was able to keep talking them down. And um, so pretty soon, I was like, like my my price point at the time. Again, this was this is just probably before the dawn of the UGL. So mm -hmm. um, my price point was was really good, and. Uh, I was able to undercut anybody, anybody in the market. Well, one day, one of my clients said, um, there's this, there's this forum that, that sells, that sells these, you, you know, you can go on and it's this, it's a forum and it's a source forum and you can go on and find all these sor sources. It said that you would do really well on there. Um, your prices are probably better than than the rest of them on here mm -hmm. and and these guys are big like they're they're making a lot of money like you should look into it so you know i just went home and i i started researching this and looking at it and and eventually i started to see like holy cow i could do this like i could undercut the rest of the people on this forum and still make a decent mm -hmm. a decent dollar so you know it, it was it was actually difficult to to be able to get online um yeah, you have to like, you know, uh, I had to get a, a server in a, in another country, in a country where, where steroids weren't illegal. And so, you know, this way, if, if the, if the government wanted to start looking into this, that, that it, they wouldn't have jurisdiction to go get all the contents from my server from a different country. So yeah, yeah, I had to set all this up. Um, so are you talking about like, uh, like secure email, like counter mail or. Well, Super I just Nota, proton mail like, that didn't exist, but counter mail was one of the earlier ones. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I just used, um, I, I actually, uh, 
like I, I'm trying to remember what I did now. I started a, a business. It was called BD Supplements. I am, and I used the Isle of Man because the Isle of Man storage. All oh, right. Room. Yeah. You mean the website? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, I, I created a website, and then I used I used a, an email address from that website. So my my email address at the time was like best gear at BD Supplements. That I am. Ah, right, right, right. Okay, the so server was in a different country. Up. Yeah, yeah, so you got the server in a different country. Uh, DM, yeah. uh, the, 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 what is it? DMS, uh, DMC yeah. takedowns that didn't exist back then, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so nobody could take your website down. And yeah. again, if it's in like some sort of, you know, country where they don't give a shit, then it's just online. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And, and, uh, you know, the United States wouldn't have, if they even wanted to, to investigate into this, they wouldn't have jurisdiction to go into a different company right. uh, c country. So mm -hmm. that was the idea. Um, yeah. And it wasn't easy to set that up, but but I was able to. And um, so I so you know one day I just one day I just went live, and uh, I I just like I bought all I had was I, I bought a little bit extra, you know, in case I got some 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 people to to buy from me. So I just had this duffel bag full of supplements or uh, full of steroids and a laptop. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, one day I just went live. And so <laughs> now I guess it's time to, to talk about, about the, the zeitgeist at the time. Right. So at the time mm -hmm. that I did this, there wasn't really, there wasn't UGLs. Um, in the late nineties, early two thousands, even, even the mid two thousands, there was a lot of fakes that went around like fakes aren't really a yeah. thing anymore because it's so easy to make real testosterone and there's a lot of good sources and the sources are out there that that fakes are kind of a thing of the past but it used to be massive like there was way more fakes going around than there were real stuff so and, and a lot everybody of the fakes was, came from mexico right yeah, at least in the united states yeah because in mexico they just saw an easy buck and a lot of guys would drive over the border get their steroid yeah. cycle yeah from the quote-unquote pharmacy yeah there's like a million different brands didn't know what to buy and half of the yeah. shit was fake yeah from what i understand yeah, yeah. so and um yes yeah, so so people didn't because of all the fakes that were happening people only trusted a few brand names right like uh right. um there was no real ugls at the time and mm -hmm. and uh, like I, I'm trying to think of some of the brands that are out at the time, like a uh, quality vet from Mexico. Right. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, British dragon was one of the names, right. uh, British dispensary. Yeah. yeah. Still British around. Dispensary. British dispensary is still around, but it's, um, they only produce anadrol and winstrol. And yeah. it's actually quite hard to get the rest. What they produce is like, um, like a heat powder. You know, you put the powder in your armpits and you get like a little bit of this cold, Oh like yeah, there's all kinds of normal products nowadays. Yeah, but I can still I get the that. anadrol and, and winstrol. Yeah, remember those? Just Google green... it. British British dispensary. It's like a legit pharmaceutical company now. Oh yeah, all kinds of weird. Yeah, all kinds of weird products. Remember, remember the um, those green um, hexagon anadrol? Like that's what British yeah, dispensary are... is famous for, right? Is those? Yeah, those are. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those are, those are those... still available. Those oh, yeah. are still available. Those are those are powerful. Yeah. Um, so. I used to pay like six dollars a pill for. I mean, not when I sold it. Like when I was a client, right? Like I would go to my guy at the gym, and mm -hmm. it was like I would pay six dollars a pill for those. <laughs> you have to pay for the flight. Yeah, <laughs> you probably got like three bottles back. Yeah, <laughs> you have to pay for the flight. That's the yeah. markup. <laughs> it's funny. Like everything's so much cheaper now too. Like it's funny. Like oh, it was yeah. expensive. Steroids were expensive and they're hard to get. But there was a lot of fakes going on. So people would be would be. Like the zeitgeist at the time is is people were always on the lookout for fakes. They only trusted a few brand names. And if mm -hmm. you were online and and presented and you were a nobody and you presented that you were selling steroids, people would get angry at you. Like, how dare you come in here and try to and no, and try to sell the all us? Because you know you're not a, a name person. And especially if you had something that wasn't named brand, you could forget it. Like you would get laughed right off the right off the site, and and there would there would be derogatory remarks. Like it, so, so when I first came on and I and I offered, you know, I have at the time I was reselling British Dragon, so the name of my company right. was BD Supplements. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had and British Dragon was one of the accepted brand names at the time. Yeah, at the time, yeah. Um, but. 
but still it was comes from somebody who didn't have a name and i got laughed at like everybody was like you got to be kidding me another one of these jokers trying to you know so like it, there was a lot of derision and derogatory remarks and animosity that would come on anybody who's just a no-name trying to sell this stuff you know again the fake problem was so bad so so uh a couple so i i again i put my stuff up there and and everybody almost and everybody laughed at me and it took like a couple of guys contacted me privately and said look i, I like british dragon gear and at the time i was one of the only people who had british dragon gear on on this specific mm -hmm. site and uh and they said but i can't take a chance that that you have something fake so why don't you send me something and uh, and, when I get it, and it's the sponsorship real, is born yeah, then you know I get it, and it's real. Then I'll post all over that this was real and good stuff. And and I, and so like you know a lot of these forums too, they have the membership, right? Like in this specific forum, I had like a point scale, and depending mm -hmm. on how much you were respected throughout the community, how much you had helped people and everything, you you get this mm -hmm. this points. So this guy had a lot of points, which means he had been around in this community for a while, and people knew him and mm -hmm. respected him. So. So then I looked for a couple other guys like that, right? And I said, okay, I'm just going to send you guys some stuff and right. and just post about it when you get it. And uh, so sure enough, they did. I sent it to them. And I sent it to them fast too, which at the time, again, some of the, so, you know, steroid dealers weren't known as masters in business business administration. So they were, oh, no. they were doing things like they were taking two weeks to get people their products, right. even domestically, right? Domestically, yeah. the shipping was slow. The the customer service was terrible. Um, it's not Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's what they always say. It's, it's not eBay. This yeah. is not Amazon. You got to wait. And they were rude to their clients too. That's another thing I noticed yeah. on these boards, like these other sources there, like, you know, when, when you, when you have all of these people fawning over something that you have, right. It's like, it's this big dose response, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, and you can be, can become manic from, you know, this is what happens to some actors and, and people who have a lot of sycophants, right? So on these boards, yeah. these sources would have sycophants, like thousands of them, like fawning over them because they have something that they want that helps them, right? Yeah. So these these sources would become manic and they would treat their yeah. clients like shit. And it was, it, it, and I vowed I would never do that. Like, I'm, I'm never going to do that. I'm going to have... Oh, so the, best these, or, the best source currently is uh, doing exactly what you used to do. He provides the best service. Yeah. So he sends it fast. So yeah, that's why he's the best. Yeah. In the beginning, all I did was instill some pretty simple good business practices that didn't exist in this industry at the time. It was fast shipping mm -hmm. um, and free shipping. You know, the, the shipping at the time was like for, for, um, uh, what do you call it? The priority the shipping, which is two or three yeah, days. Person. It was only, um, like seven bucks. Right? And and I had at the yeah. time, I think I had a $200 minimum order. So that was nothing. So I just covered the shipping, yeah, and everything priority. Nobody else was doing that at the time. I, um, I was, my customer service was excellent. I was always, you know, really nice and respectful and made sure, um, uh, the customer service was good, things like that. And then I'll start talking in a little bit about the quality, how I made sure that the quality, there was a time when I probably had some of the best quality possibly in the world. Um, just because mm -hmm. of the, I was one of the only ones who was actually able to do to do like sourcing at the time and testing and i did i had some unique ways to do testing um but yeah because back then there was no hplc there, testing like there was no shake or some you other service couldn't send your your stuff yeah. anywhere to get tested like it didn't exist mm -hmm. now you can like this was it jenko labs or is it is it Jan no shake oh yeah yeah jenko yeah, was it yeah. was it was they reached out to me a while well back. They're super, super kind people. Super nice. Yeah. I asked them, so can I get a discount card? They said, we can't handle your volume. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. No, they have a problem with importation. So when you send a sample over, they have to specify what it's for every every single batch. And sometimes it's hard because, of course, when you send something in for testing, it might not be exactly what it says it is. Mm -hmm. It has to be tested first. So, so they're having some supply issues. Oh, or, yeah. or clearance clearance issues but they're i mean they're doing the the, the, the world of service yeah, of course you know back then back then it was not available no so so how, how would you test it like there was no roy test no lap max no janushik yeah you do crowdsourcing <laughs> crowdsourcing so okay so i started um so there's a couple things here um 
I'm trying to think, should I wait? Let me, let me just continue mm -hmm. with this part and then I'll get into the testing. Sure. Right? But because <laughs> sure. like, sorry, like, so I think this part is, is really good. This part is interesting. So I sent it away to these few people, right? To the, to the, um, uh, the, you know, the couple people and, and sure enough, when they received yeah. it pretty quickly, first they commented on the shipping time and they started posting mm -hmm. pictures and everything on the forums. And then they post it. And then, you know, when it started kicking in, they started talking about, oh yeah, this stuff is great. You know, the quality is there, the shipping, the customer service is great. And then um, some of those guys, people come to them, where did you get that? And then he, they would send them directly to me. So right. again, when I first started this, I almost got laughed off of the, laughed off of the site. And, and I was, I was hoping, hoping, you know, at the time I didn't make much money. Like my, my local gig, I just lived in a small city, so it wasn't, and I, I worked in an emergency room. I only made like 250 bucks a week. Um, mm. I, you know, I could, I didn't have much money. I could barely support myself. And I was hoping, hoping that I could make two to 300 extra dollars a week. That's what I was, I was like, if I could do that, then I would be comfortable. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that would be, that's what like, and I thought that was a little overzealous, right? I thought that, that's probably, it's probably not going to happen. Um, you know, whatever. So again, once, once I, um, these, uh, these people started posting about the stuff that I said, I only had to do it to like three for like three people. I sent them some free stuff and they started mm -hmm. posting about it. And then people started coming, uh, coming to me and to these guys and asking them where they got it. And then they sent them to me and it didn't take very long with, with the big good business practices that I implemented for this to just blow up. Like the next thing you know, other people start, people are receiving their products. They start posting, Oh, I got this in three so days. Well, like, yeah. and nobody yeah. else was doing it at the time. So they're like, what? you got somebody who get your stuff in three days. And then all of a sudden it just blew up. And, and like I said, I was hoping, hoping to make two to 300 extra bucks a week. Within six months, I was bringing in $21,000 a week. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then like it went up to 30,000 a week. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, a year, year later it was 50,000 a week. And then by the end we were doing over a hundred thousand a week. Uh, and sometimes, yeah. you know, there was a couple months when I did half a million in a week. Jesus. It was crazy. It, it just blew so, up. So, like so I how, never how, dreamed. No, and I'm sure, I'm sure. So how does the money flow work then? Like back then you had Western Union yeah, and MoneyGram. Yeah. And then would you use like one of these Chinese guys to collect the money for you? Yeah. So there's several things I had to do there. And and so, so after, yeah, probably about the first year, if not under the first year, I had a big problem and it was collecting all the money. Like I was making yeah. too much money. There's too much money and I couldn't collect it all. So I had to come up with something. So it started off with an army of people collecting Western unions and money grams. Yeah. And that's how I started. I just pay people. I'd pay them like 6%, you know, go collect this couple of grants. Oh, and, and, uh, yeah. and yeah. And yeah. And you know, yeah, it was pretty good. Cause people were collecting thousands and thousands of dollars a week. So it was, mm -hmm. um, but the problem with Western union is like people can only collect like 20, 30,000 a year before they red flag them and they shut their name down. Yeah, that they, they said, but in China there's unlimited people. Yeah, yeah, they have so many <laughs> people. Yeah. people to collect so, for you. So one I thing, remember like, yeah. well, let me interject real quick. I remember when I used to order online, this is like over a decade ago, and then you know, have to send Western Union to China. And I'm like, why the hell is it in China? But this yeah. is like the guy that works for the source that sends the powders to the guy that I buy the finished steroids from, right? And this is how they kind of, make the money go around and then once in a while there'll be a big fat transfer to hong kong and then to the united states because exporting money from china is a nightmare even back in the day yeah. um yeah. So, so, and then you know you would order from the source again six months later and have a different chinese name and then mm -hmm. a different yeah. guy and then a different guy you know and you have to be like write it on the form super carefully like yeah. what the you know the, the numbers yeah. are and so if you met if you mess it up yeah. once and then sometimes these guys would be so flooded that if you sent them the the Western Union form, uh, you know, or MoneyGram form that you paid, they would just send the order. And then a lot of these fuckers on the boards would start scamming. They would cancel the Western Union yeah. uh, because the guy would pick it up a week or two later. Mm -hmm. And they would cancel it just to get free product. Yeah. That was, you know, those guys would get kicked off the boards, but that, that would happen over and over again because yeah. these guys figured it out. Like oh, they're not going to collect for another 10 days. So I'll just cancel it. Yeah. I already got my tracking. 
fucking dude. assholes. Yeah. This is how everything goes uh, goes sour, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's built on trust. Yeah. After all. Yeah, yeah, you're you absolutely know? right. Yeah. And um and sometimes too, like the they would have so many, so much money sent to each name that mm. sometimes by the time you sent the money, the name would be red flagged. So uh, you would have to then you would have to change the name of the person and you'd have to like call Western Union and be like, oh no, I meant instead of Zhao Ping, I meant Zhao Yang. <laughs> <laughs> Zing Zing Yang. And and <laughs> you would have to change the name. And uh, and that was a process through Western Union, but that happened too. Yeah. And but it's still being used. Western Union and MoneyGram to check. Yeah. It's still being done. It's yeah. hilarious. Again, Bitcoin existed at this time, but it was it was just it was a it was an afterthought. It wasn't nobody was using yeah. it. Yeah. So now Bitcoin Yeah, I think I so I think I put in my first Bitcoin order in two thousand fourteen. So that's three yeah. years three years after like two thousand fifteen, that's when I got into Bitcoin. Yeah. And that was wasn't even for steroids, it was for DNP and and some other bullshit, you know, yeah. that I wanted to try. Yeah. Yeah. Because all, all the steroid, steroid guys would use Western Union or MoneyGram and yeah. counter mill. Yeah. <laughs> so good times. So so one time, like I was having a problem. I was having a problem with collecting money. And and so so another way that I was collecting money was the the green dot cards. Right. So um I don't That's know if right. you ever heard of a green dot card. So what it is is you can you go buy this like little reloadable credit card um mm -hmm. at, at the at the store at just any convenience store and then you could buy a reload pack and and with mm -hmm. that reload the reload pack would just be a, a code right and then you put this code into the website mm -hmm. with your card number and it would reload that money to that card right but this way ah. somebody in california could buy um a reload pack from their local convenience store and give me the number and i could reload my card in new york uh just by ah. with that with that code right and buy groceries or something yeah right yeah uh, so <laughs> so i but there were several companies who had cards like this right um, but the yeah. problem with these cards is you can you know in order to to clamp down on on out of laundering or the illicit use of money that they would only allow you to load so much money on it and and spend and pull out so much cash because you could pull it out of the ATM, cash out of the ATM, but only so much. And then once you did so much, they would shut the card down. They didn't tell you how much. They just one day your card uh -huh. would be shut down. So I had to figure out through trial and error all these like, how much can you load on it without getting shut down? How much can you pull off of it without getting shut down? So I ended up like I had, I used to pay people here, get me one of these cards. You just go on, on the website. Um, fill out a form and they send you a card to your address and then I would get it to them. And I had like 30 of them myself. And then I would also <laughs> pay people to have their own cards. I would say, yeah. I'm going to load your card up at the end of the, each week, bring me, bring me the, you know, pull out $200 three times a week out, out of each of your cards and then bring me the money by the end of the week. And I'll, I'll pay you, you know, a certain amount of money. So I just and had armies of people like yeah. doing all this. And then um, you have stacks of cash. Yeah. And a lot of these cards. So, and that was kind of a benefit because mm -hmm. then like, you know, you could hold like, a, like two or $3,000 on each of these cards. And I had like 30 of them. Mm -hmm. So the pro the problem came to be with like, they, they'd fill up too much and then I, and I'd have to spend it. Right. Which, <laughs> which, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I would have to get rid of the money and you can't pull it out again in cash because you can only pull so much out in cash. So it, like, I don't know. now you really have to do a laundry. Like you have to buy a car or something or something secondhand and then, yeah, uh, I don't know, flip it, something like that. Yeah, I, there, there's all, I don't know. It, it, it became really complicated. Um, yeah. So at one point, I still, I was, the, the problem was, um, especially when I, because I had to, I had to pay my suppliers, my powder suppliers, and I had to, or, or the, the sources, what, wherever it was, when I transitioned into a UG, UGL, Mm -hmm. I had to pay the powder sports. So before that, I had to pay this this guy who was giving me the British Dragon, the source that was the IP China was giving me this British Dragon. And um, I was paying them. I was paying all of my employees, right? So it was like I was collecting all the money and then dispersing it out, and that was becoming a problem. So, yeah. you know, it sounds like a simple solution, but it wasn't an easy solution at the, at the time. But I, I finally sat down and thought about it, 
And I finally came up with the solution is I would get, have the, my customers send people, um, send, send the money where I needed it to go. So I would, mm. and the same thing, what you're talking about, all the guys who wanted to do Western union, I would have them send it to my suppliers in China. And I asked the suppliers, Hey, can you just send me a bunch of names? And they updated them. Like you said, every month they'd give me more names and my customers would send right to my suppliers and then they'd keep a bank, like an account for me. Right. So I had this, yeah, account you got some debit. Yeah, and then some when I need powders, I just say, uh, give me this, 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 and they take it out of my account. And just send right. powders. Right. Yeah. And as simple as that sounds, it actually, it, it took a while for, for it to come to me. And then I also got my, all my employees, those cards. So right from the customer. Well, you were, you were probably one of the first who came up with that idea. Now everybody's doing it. Yeah. But you were yeah. probably the, 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 the one to initiate, because if they didn't offer this to you, then, yeah. and, and you said, hey, wait a minute, do you have like 10 guys that can collect money and then yeah. do some credit for, for the product? All that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you were probably one of the first who started that process. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing is, if you notice now, everybody sends priority shipping. Right. But, but nobody yeah. was doing that at the time. And like now, no. now the, you know, the level of customer service, like a lot of the things I implemented are being, are being done now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to say like, they said, oh, this is this guy. We have to do things like this guy, but like, because I was doing things that just made sense. Right. So over yeah, time, these things just made sense, but stand out. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, I, so now, and I was sending my employees money right from their customers. So now that cut me out as the middleman to collect all the money and then disperse it all out. Right. So now it was going to where it needed to be. And then the money I collected was just mine. Right. Right. So, so that, that actually really like kind of fixed the money flow problems. And it was a huge relief because it, it was be becoming a problem for me to collect all the money and then disperse it back out to people. So, um, so that was a major fix of a problem. So, now we can go on the sourcing, so or, or testing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, so let me let me go on first to. Uh, so I was reselling this from IP. Uh, so IP China. This is kind of funny too. So IP China mm -hmm. was um, reselling some name brands, and they had their own brand. And, and again, like when I first found them in the early 2000s, this is pretty funny. They made their own stuff, but they didn't have the operation professionalized at all. Again, this is bef before the dawn of the UGL. So they used to send their stuff in test tubes, right? With a cork on the top. <laughs> so, so in the early 2000s, like, because it was so much cheaper to buy that than the name brand stuff, like, and we trusted the source, right? So yeah. We would buy these and we'd get these test tubes and you put your you take the cork off, you put the needle in the test tube and and, and inject yourself and it was good. It was good stuff. So like like a bunch oh, of you didn't even need to fil both. filter it or anything? I they probably filtered it, I'm guessing. I hope. I don't know. <laughs> like before they put it in the test tube, yeah. <laughs> and uh but it was working just fine. And so a bunch of us, all of our buddies were were getting these cheap, you know, really cheap at the time, like all these all these compounds and uh, uh and using them and it was fine it was really good the stuff was really good quality it was it was great do you do you remember what carrier oil they used do they use like grapeseed oil or cotton seed or i like i never even back then i never even asked i i didn't know i didn't ask uh i because mean i was wondering what what british dragon used because like right now the underground lab scene here in asia is so terrible that i had to inform everybody multiple times over the last couple of years that ethyl oleate, propylene glycol, monoethylene glycol, all these synthetic solvents are terrible for your health. Yeah. So I wonder what they used back in the day because I never got a chance to use British Dragon because it was already rolled up, right? The owners had a split and then one of yeah. them got arrested. He actually died here in jail yeah. from HIV complications. Yep. Um, yeah. Or he had HIV and then he had pneumonia or something. I think something like that happened. He, yeah. he died in one of the Thai jails. But British Dragon is still around. Yeah, it is. But, uh, that, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I noticed owners. that they don't. Yeah, I've noticed that. So, so interestingly enough, I sold British Dragon after they got busted in 2008. So after all oh, that okay. happened, so this is how yeah. that happened, right? So yeah. the I my, my IP guy, once British Dragon went down, he just mm -hmm. he 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 had again he made they made their own stuff, and they mm -hmm. used to call it. They used to have a name for their stuff. It might have been just IP. 
I'm trying to remember. Probably now. IP because I remember that of that time that. IP. Yeah, it might have been just IP. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and um, but he realized the benefit of using the brand name, so he just started slapping British Dra- Dragon labels on his stuff and and calling oh. it British Dragon. And he made those even the British dispensary. He made those octagons. They made them the green octagons. So he had stamps just like other stuff. So, but his stuff was good. And, and Mm -hmm. on the forms and the board, the boards, like a lot of guys knew that IP was just, was relabeling British dragon stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and a lot of people knew it, but their stuff was good too. So it didn't matter. So even if you got the IP British dragon or the old British dragon, it was all good stuff. So it didn't matter. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so it still had a good name. So I was just using the IP British dragon. Uh, and we were getting it at a really good price. And that's, you know, th- that's what I started off selling. Mm. At some point, this guy started getting flaky, right? And he kind of always had been, but it wasn't a problem until I needed, like, you know, I was ordering massive amounts from him on a weekly yeah. basis. And How'd you get the shit in the country? He did. He was them. good at it. I don't know. Like, I have a theory. Oh, that maybe- so, you, so you bought it, you got it locally. No, he he get it to me through through customs, but he was good at it. <laughs> oh wow! Like like it was. It, Those were I think the guys, a lot huh? of it had to do with the packaging. <laughs> and I also have a theory that he that they paid some guys through customs because they got so yeah, many probably. packages through. Yeah. Um, I don't know that for a fact though. But what I do know is like they they would only send in a certain size package, right? So it was, it was these mm-hmm. small ones. And my powder sources did that later too. Is like they mm-hmm. wouldn't send a package bigger than like. I don't know, bigger than this, right? So no, it is in the small Amazon the um, stuff in there. Yeah, pack it in there and then. And because I guess the smaller package were less likely to be searched, is my guess, right? So, mm-hmm. so it had to do with sizing and and they knew where to send it. I, I, they knew like what ports to send it through. And these guys were good at getting stuff through. Like I rarely got stuff, but for especially for the amount that I ordered, I rarely got stuff. Mm-hmm. And if if I did, like I just had, I would just pay people to for receiving houses. And if they got a customs yeah. letter, I would just change the house. Um, yeah. And so it's like I had tons of addresses. And um, so uh, so these guys started getting flaky. And I knew at, at one point that I had to build something more robust. All my eggs were, were in one basket. Mm-hmm. So um, I knew I had to do something else. So I started looking at other brands, but all the other brands were way more expensive and I'd have to raise my prices. And one of my things was having some of the best prices uh, undercutting right. everybody else. Mm. So I didn't want to do that. So then at first I didn't make it, I didn't make anything myself. I didn't know how to do it. And at, at this time you couldn't just Google it like you can now and, and get recipes on how to was it, was it. Was it, was base killer online? Oh, the website. I mean, we're, it, we're was. It's just home it was, was that it was a thing. It was, but, and, and I did go there, but it wasn't extensive. It wasn't, right. it wasn't super extensive at this time. Um, mm. But, uh, so, but by now I've made hundreds of thousands of miles because I, you know, I learned how to do it and, and I taught mm. a bunch of other people how to, a bunch of my other chemists how to do it too. Mm. Um, but at, so at the time I just, I knew another local guy who, who made his own stuff and he used to, he used to just make it and he'd sell these, these vials without a label on it locally. And, um, so that's how I knew he was doing it. Like, you know, we were in a small city, all the dealers knew each other and we were all am- amicable with each other as well. All right. And okay, so when I, when I started thinking about it, I'm like, well, what if, what if we just make our own brand? And like, so I brought this opportunity to this guy, you know, he was again, he was low level, um, you know, kind of just squeezing by. And when, you know, one of the funny things was that when, when I did this, I had a group of people because when I started getting big, like I had to expand. So I got help and employees, mm-hmm. but I impressed upon everybody how important it was to be quiet, to, to keep this, you know, keep this quiet because, well, yeah, of where course. we were going to get in trouble was the local game, right? Like if, mm-hmm. if the local authorities came to get us, they could come bust us. But it, right. so, so it was more about, I even quit selling locally. So like, I didn't, so that my name wouldn't get attached to, to selling this stuff because the, the inner, the national game was so much, obviously so much more lucrative and that was all right. anonymous. So we weren't going to, it was a lot less chance we're going to get caught anonymously through the national game the national game than we were locally through some local cops. Right. So, 
Um, so we kept everything quiet and we did a good job. And so when I went to this other dealer and I took him, I had to show him what I was doing and prove it to him. So he didn't think this was a lie. Like when I, I started showing him all the money that was coming in, I showed him like, you know, the website, like what we were doing and the volume, the sheer volume we were doing. He was just had his mouth open and he was just shocked. So I was like, and you know, I was going to be able, he was going to be able to start making like significant, significantly more money than he probably ever thought possible. So, and I, you know, I just offered him this opportunity and, and of course he took it. So he started just, you know, making this in, in mass quantities and then showed me how to do it. Um, so you're, and, you're, you're blending like 10 liters at a time. Oh, I'm trying to think of how much we did at a time. He used to make, uh, a hundred vials and, and we did 20 milliliter vials and he'd make a hundred of those oh, yeah. at a time two liters yeah 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 <laughs> I can but, but he'd do it several of... times a day right so he i mean he could make he could make like a thousand vials a day uh if he worked Jeez. out there <clears throat> how do you how do you how do you press all that through a whatman filter though like how do you we sterilize had, all that stuff we we had uh we had filters the the pumps Oh, so it's automated. Yeah. Yeah. We had automatic pumps. Wow. And then oh, yeah, it's almost it, like a pharmaceutical company. At this yeah. Point. You, at the time you could buy that stuff. Like, well, you still can. You can buy it on the med lab supply or whatever. You can get pumps. No, oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, th that was actually the easy part. Um, but some of the hard part was like, like Masteron, right? Was it, it has this black, when you make it, it has this, like, it turns into this like dark, almost black or dark green. And that it's tough to filter. So you have to like use several filters and you, you have to do the first few batches with a bigger filter with the 45, oh, really? um, 45 okay. micrometer instead of the 22. Okay. So, and then, and then you can, uh, once you get all of this, the stuff out of it, like, I don't know, that, that, that was a tough one, but, but the rest of them were pretty easy. Anyways. Um, so we started making that in, in mass scale. And again, so when I put this on my site, on my list, I call it, we decided to call it Matrix Labs. And I didn't think people were going to take to it because, again, it was um, it was a name that nobody knew, right? It, and this was the yeah, dawn of the right? UGL. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. I certainly wasn't the first, but there was a couple of UGLs around, but it wasn't a big thing. There's only a few. and But I didn't think people were going to trust this new brand that I had. Um, so I didn't think it would take right away, but I made everything stronger. I made, and, and I'll, then I'll discuss how I got the quality. Um, mm -hmm. but when I, so when I, um, first put this on there, I expected the slow transition to people because the matrix lab stuff was, it was more potent and it was a little cheaper because I, you know, my, but, but also my, my, um, profit Profit margin went from about the the BD stuff, the British Dragon stuff, was about four hundred percent to mm. it went to like a thousand percent at from my uh, the Matrix Lab stuff because I could make it even cheap, you know, cheaper than a lot cheaper than yeah. People, people don't understand how how little you actually spent on the yeah, powders and the yeah. vials and yeah. like Clembutrol, for example. I think the packaging is more expensive than yeah. the actual Clembutrol in the box. Yeah, the for us it was about equal. Like the, the steroids in the, in the vial was about the same as the vial, the stopper and the, yeah. you know, the cost of the stuff, the, the kinker and the, um, yeah, the markup is insane. Yeah. People have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we started making this, I put this on, on the list and I expected there'd be a really slow transition and, but right away, everybody just started buying the matrix labs. And then what I realized is that the brand was me, right? Like I was the brand, like they, you know, yeah. mm. I started because I had a good name because I, I treated everybody right. Like whatever I put up there, they would buy and they did. And everybody right. immediately transitioned to the matrix labs. And then the matrix land labs brand name was, was running through the, the forums, all the forums through the pro circuit. Um, these things were coming up because, you know, I, it was, and it just took off even more. Like all these little things that I did just kept building the business bigger and bigger. And so, yeah. And especially if you offered a price even lower, 
Yeah, you know, the price was lower. It, it's like, good, and you overdose it, the price lower. I mean, what more do you want yeah, as a bodybuilder? It's right. cheap, and yeah. it's strong. Yeah, exactly <laughs> and it's right. And fast shipping. I mean, what more do you want? <laughs> yeah, and, and later I learned that, obviously I can't say any names, but I started to learn that the stuff was running through the pro circuit, and some of the bigger names in the business were using my stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so quality. So, again, you couldn't test anything, right? So... At first, the first thing I started doing was crowdsourcing, right? So I crowdsourcing testing. Like I would get some of my some of my clients that ordered for me a lot. And I would ask them, you know, here, I'll give you a price break. Do you want to, can you go get a blood test? Take it, take this much, you know, X amount right. on this day, go get a blood test. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and then give me, let me see the results. I want to see what it brings to your blood levels too. Right. So I started now different people will process testosterone or these at different rates. Right. So it's not like that is a, is a no all, but, but it did, it did give me an idea, especially if I could keep using the same person for different, different batches. Right. Right. One thing I forgot to mention is, so once you start to become big like this, the Chinese power sources come to you and they want to sell you your stuff. Right. So I, I probably had a hundred different Chinese sources coming to me. And I took samples from almost all of them. Some of your samples, if they're good, if it's good, then I'll make you my new supplier. And I was sending these guys like, you know, probably 400, half a million a year. That's, you know, that's how much I was spending on the raw materials. And and I had like three different sources that I was doing that with too. So it was a, you know, these sources wanted, these Chinese powder sources wanted, wanted my business. Of course. So I took all these powders and I would, we'd make little vials. First we try it on ourselves, right? And then, you know, once we were like, okay, this is good. Then I'd crowdsource, you know, and get, get people to give me blood levels. Um, and, and I, so, and I would kind of whittle away the, the different uh, sources that we're getting by the most, the best and most consistent results, right. Kind of, kind of doing it this way. Then there was a time, so I was doing this. And then there was also a time when we, one of my clients was a, assistant professor at a college at a, a assistant chemistry professor at a college and he had access to a mass spec machine so oh, he yeah. could so he started saying hey listen send me some stuff i'll mass spec it for you and i can get purities for you you know and, and we used to That's pay right. him for this so the problem yeah, was that he started, <laughs> once he realized he started doing it for us and once he realized yeah. like like how valuable that that option was that he started asking other sources he'd do that. And then he was getting overloaded, right? He was like, yeah, like, and then it was, then I had to pay like a ton of money for having all these the, steroid batches. Yeah. I'd get, I had to pay tons of money to get pushed to the front of the line to have a certain batch tested. Right? And, uh, and eventually he just stopped because it was like, you know, <laughs> because he's going to like jeopardize his position at the university. For, <laughs> um, so, but, so we were getting actually mass spec testing for a while too. And nobody else was getting that at the time. Again, I told you, like, like we were the first ones doing that. And then I had been doing my other testing. So I was able to whittle these powders away to the top three sources that were most consistent and most potent. Mm-hmm. So, and nobody else was doing that at the time. So, like, there's a possibility at one time I had, like, the most potent and best quality powders uh, in the world, possibly. Yeah. Um, at one point, on, on the biggest... Uh, source forum in the world. Uh, we were rated number three in the world, and I only served the United States. I didn't serve outside of the United States, and right. and I was still, as far as popularity and and um, business, like we we were rated number three when they rated all the sources. So, and that was around you know this time when. So then again, the Matrix Lab started running through the pro circuit, started running through all the forums. Um, Everybody was talking about it. You could go to any forum and I'd see people talking about it. It was crazy. It was just, it was absolutely crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, and it's just yeah. doing steroids, like no peptides, no ancillaries. No, no I, had, I had, um, well, th- this IP source, they had everything, right? It was, so right. that was another thing that benefited ours is that we were a one-stop shop. I had everything from T3 to DNP. We had DNP. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. I had a, a human growth hormone. Um, you know, I mm-hmm. offered like at this time, if you remember the, like the yellow tops, black tops, blue tops, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I had yeah, all yeah, those, yeah. uh, and so, and we had a lot of different stuff. So, yeah. And I, so I would just, 
to these IP guys, I would just be like, uh, just send me, you know, uh, I don't know so much of everything you got. <laughs> and they had a lot of stuff. So, so our list was pretty extensive. And that was another reason people came to us because we were a one-stop shop. You could get everything from us. Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the way to do it, right? You don't have to shop anywhere else because you got everything in the house. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, so, I so, never, never dreamed it would go like that, but I couldn't, like, there was a time when it first started. Like, mm -hmm. again, I, I never had that much money. I never dreamed I would make that much money. Uh, I, at the time I had a hundred thousand dollars in my hands at my house and I almost like, I got scared. I got terrified. I'm like, this is getting <laughs> yeah, too I'm big. Sure. Uh, of this course, if you're big. in this kind of business, yeah, yeah it's, it's a like, lot I'm of money. Get caught. Like I got to, I got to hundred thousand. So Sorry, this is what the early 2000s, right? So 100,000 yeah. back then is like 200,000. Yeah, it was. Well, this was probably actually like 2011. I, I started 2010 okay. and then I got busted in mm -hmm. 2015, okay. late 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it was probably 2010. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, I got scared, right? I had all this money. I'm like, I'm going to get caught. So I had this plan where I was going to quit, but I was going to fill all the orders from the money I had taken and then tell everybody like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. This has gotten out of control. <laughs> it's too big. And then <laughs> to be honest with you, what I thought about what drove me on is every day I would get emails from people thanking me, thanking me for making them a better husband to their wife, a better, yeah, mm -hmm. a better father to their yeah. children, a better supporter of their family. Because, you know, it, again, the medical community failed us with these compounds. They push, yeah, they I'm push sure, I'm, people I'm sure. into the black market uh, because they can't right. they can't get beneficial treatments. And a lot of my clients were just TRT users, but they just yeah. I was just going to say that I'm sure oh, that, that I'm, I'm sure a large portion of your guys were half. just TRT oh, guys yeah. that had friends in the bodybuilding circuit, but yeah. just wanted to run a little bit of test. Yeah, more than half of my guys were just TRT guys, and they're and they're just getting it from me because it was ten times cheaper getting it from me than a clinic. Yeah, and. uh so, you know, it, and so I used to get emails every single day. And when I thought mm -hmm. about having, you know, again, like a lot of people, when you're, when you when you run this kind of empire, right, when you, when you're put in this kind of position, they think, well, well, why did you do it? Why did you, you know, you knew you could get into trouble like this. And I did, I knew, uh, I knew mm -hmm. I was breaking the law. I knew I was accountable for those actions. Um, and, and I am accountable for those actions. I knowingly broke the law right? and I get that. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you think about why you did it, people like to say, well, you're just greedy, right? You're just greedy. You just wanted the money. And that, and that's an easy, like little package for people to put it in. So they explain it to themselves, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's just, oh, you were greedy. Just wrap it up in this nice little greed package, throw it out. And then that's it. That's the explanation. But that's not it. Mm -hmm. It was when I thought about all these people who I was helping, Right. It was more about helping people. When I thought, when I thought about all these people, I was helping all these people thanking me every day for making their lives better at an affordable price and me going to these people and saying, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't help you improve your life anymore because yeah. I'm having a yeah. little bit of an anxiety attack right now. When I thought about that, I couldn't go tell these people that I couldn't say, no, I can't help you anymore. And this was thousands and thousands of people. So yeah, and you so can't I just put my down. head down and I said, fuck this. I can do this. Yeah. I just put my head down yeah. and, and made it all happen. And, it, and it, a lot of it was, was this helping people. Yes, the money is nice. Yes, it was, it, I had a lot of fun. The money was nice. But when, when, you, when it comes down to what was the driving force and the passion, it was knowing how many people I was helping and not letting those people down. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise you have to feed them, literally throw them to the wolves. And, and yeah. if you know that the underground lab scene is shit, which it yeah. still is, <laughs> right, the underground lab scene is now shittier than ever, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, I mean, what are kind of people going to do? I mean, I, I make videos on what people need to pay attention yeah. to. Right. But I hear these horror stories every day. Oh, source X, Y, Z caused me this infection or this problem or ripped me off or right. So it's, yeah, it's quite problematic. So if you're servicing so many people, you can't just say, Hey, I'm out, um, yeah. you know, because they rely on you and mm -hmm. where else are they going to go? Yeah. They can't go to the doctor. And this is, you know, since the restrictions are getting more and more and more, I mean, they, they need, they need to get it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of what the the medical community does by, and, and the government does by putting these restrictions by, by you know, making it so difficult to get. Is that they they created this black market and they push people into the black market when you see it all the time.
Yeah. No, it's a shame. So what, what did eventually do you in? Like how, how did the empire crumble? So let me go into how the operation, how I developed the operation, and then mm -hmm. that will lead into what went wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once I started getting bigger, I couldn't do it on my own. So I had to expand. So I started getting people, hiring people to do specific jobs. And the, the different mm -hmm. jobs were shipping. Um, at first, I didn't have a chemist because I was reselling BD. But then when I when I had uh, when I started making uh, when we started the UGL, then we had chemists as well. Um, and I had money collectors. And this is probably where I went wrong again. So what I started to do is I wanted to compartmentalize the operation. So mm -hmm. I started at first, I hired some guys I know. And, you know, <laughs> I couldn't put resumes out and, and collect like some of the best qualified people to be able to do these jobs. So I had to pick from a pool of people I knew who, who would be willing to do this kind of work. And I didn't always get the best. Yeah. So <clears throat> over time, like I started to realized the benefit of compartmentalizing, compartmentalizing the operation and actually hiring people I didn't know that well. Um, and they were actually usually just customers, right? So yeah, um, customers mm -hmm. who, who in, expressed an interest and then I would like really uh, vet them for a while, you know, asking them questions, just making sure that this was something they could do. But these were people who didn't know my name or they usually just knew my first name. But so the idea was to compartmentalize the operation where everybody does their own job, the shipping, the chemists, uh, and the money collectors, and they're all in different states because what's going to get the whole operation busted is if we're all in the same area and say, even the local cops caught wind of it, they could take down this operation right now. If we spread it out across the country, then the local gang couldn't do anything. If by chance they did catch wind of a piece of the operation, it wouldn't take the whole thing down. And the idea was that everybody doesn't know each other. So you couldn't tell on other people if even if you wanted to, right? So, right. so everybody was compartmentalized. They only knew their role in the operation. They didn't know anybody else. And they only knew my first name, theoretically. <laughs> people started figuring it <laughs> out. My, my, like I would, I started to get like, uh, like some of my, the guys working for me would a friend request me on Facebook. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> no, they no. Know my, now they know my idea. Oh, no. But, but anyways, <laughs> but th this was the idea. And I, and I did build it, pr build it pretty successfully at first. Um, so we were spread throughout the, the country. At one point, I had five chemists, uh, four or five shippers, um, money collectors everywhere. There's just armies of money collectors. And um, so what, what went wrong? Oh, yeah. So anyway, so what I would do is I would, you know, in the beginning, I made a lot of stuff, um, but then I just didn't have time because I was guiding people and I was the the face of the customer service. I, like I was the yeah. best at that. And, you know, I was kind of funneling the money everywhere, everywhere it needed to go, whether it had to go to employees or sources or whatever. And then, and then guiding people, uh, answering all the emails, I would get, you know, I don't know, 500 emails or more a day. And a hundred of those were people needing me to guide them through, like, look at, you know, look at blood work, help them through, you know, what to use to reach their goals, this kind of thing. So you know, I you would do that. And then 50,000. <laughs> What's that? Made another $50,000 just doing just coaching. I know. Yeah, but like, yeah. <laughs> granted, it wasn't like full blown coaching. It was just kind of quick guiding based on you know, some of the information that I had. So, but, but yeah, you're so right. The amount it, of emails that I get on a daily basis that are yeah, paid. Oh yeah, man, no. you know, it's like yeah, an hour right. every day, you know? <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> and I, and I would spend 12, 15 hours a day on this. Um, I just wake up doing yeah, this. Yeah, you could have easily made another 50 K for coaching. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> easily. So, um, and so what I would do is when somebody would order, I would just collect the, the money information, send it to the money, the person collecting money, get the order, send it to mm -hmm. a shipper, you know, one of the shippers, um, and put the order into the chemist, right? No, the chemist, sorry, the chemist would just, they would just make stuff as fast as they could and send it to the shippers. Right? Yeah. So, so this is how I did The shippers it. probably keep a little bit of stock of their own. Yeah, they keep a stack. The shippers all keep yeah. a stack. And then and I'd send the order to the shipper, the order and the address to the shipper, you know, after I collect the payment. And and this is just kind of how it worked. The 
so the chemists were usually in different country or different state than the shippers. So what they would do is they would just kind of put it in this medium sized box, wrap it all up in bubble tape and vacuum seal it, and then send it to, to the shipper. And this is where I made the mistake in the beginning. They would send it right to the shipper, right? So mm -hmm. <clears throat> this, so one time I had a personal assistant to help me with stuff because I didn't have time to do, you know, just daily, daily stuff. So I had a personal assistant that was taking care of all this, all this stuff I, that I needed to do that I didn't have time for. And she started to catch wind of what it was, what I was doing and what was going on. And eventually she wanted to be a shipper because they made so much more money than her as a personal assistant. Oh, no. And and she she really wanted the job, so I gave her the opportunity. The problem with her is that she knew she because she was the personal assistant and she had to do different things. She she was able to connect dots and put names to more of the operation than anybody else. Well, one day I had a, sh a chemist in Georgia shipping to New York, and one of the boxes was leaking, which means that they must have beat the hell out of this box because we, I mean, we really. Uh, mm -hmm. we really like vacuum sealed it, bubble, bubble tape all around it and everything. And, um, the post office was able to open it just to make sure it wasn't anything hazardous. Right. So, and there was like three of these boxes, it was probably like 30,000 worth of steroids. And, um, when they were, they opened the one and then they opened the others because it was the same name and same address, but the only, the one was leaking. And then when they saw what it was, they sent the local DEA to, to the shipper's house, which was her house. And um, we cleaned almost, we, we had word because the post office called before, uh, they called when they were going to open the package. They actually called the phone number. Um, and, uh, to confirm, huh? Yeah. yeah to, well, and they were just like, they were just like, well, this box is leaking. We have to open it to make sure. So we actually knew that they were going to be coming. So we almost had the house totally cleaned out before they got there. And so they didn't find with much, but you know how they get, they start scaring the hell out of her. It, they actually got her and one other, one other person in my operation, one other guy in my operation. Mm. <clears throat> and they scared the hell, they tried to scare the hell, they scared the hell out of her. They tried to scare him. And he was like, he was like, no, I'm not talking. Give me a lawyer. I got him a lawyer, but she blew everything that she knew in. Um, mm. And, and that's the, the first way that they started to, to kind of catch on to this, right? So uh, obviously we stopped at that point and I got him a lawyer. And so we had a kind of a behind the scenes, like understanding of what was going on. Well, again, those were the only two people in New York and the rest was all outside the country or um, outside the in different states. So so they didn't they couldn't do anything they had no jurisdiction on me even though that she gave them my name i lived in new jersey at the time they had no jurisdiction to come and get me they couldn't they couldn't really do anything they just had what they found which is just a little bit of powders and uh and some shipping materials and that was it so they gave them like the lowest class felony that they that you could get nobody spent a day in jail they even got what's called a acdc which is uh, it would have been thrown out in six months with good behavior, right? So mm -hmm. it wouldn't have even been anything on their records, and that's that's what they gave them, and that was it. They, you know, so it was so it was as far as we knew, and we talked to the lawyer and said, and the lawyer was told us that well, um, apparently the feds don't want to pick this up. It wasn't quite, it wasn't big enough for them, so the feds don't want to pick it up. It just stayed local, and that was it. So everybody got back to me and says, hey, let's keep going. Like you know, I was. You know, I had like 12, well, I had, I had 12 full-time employees and a whole bunch of money collectors. Um, and everybody wanted to keep going and I was, it was helping, helping people survive. So everybody wanted to keep going and they were like, oh, so we'll just stay out in New York. Like it's, it's no big deal. We'll stay out in New York. We'll continue with the rest of the operation. The guy who lived in New York, who got caught, he wanted to keep going too. And he moved to Nevada. And, uh, so we just kept going, um, you know, it was going to stay local and that was it. The thing that I did wrong is we had a chemist send to a shipping house where we had, where, where we had the shipping operation. So mm -hmm. I changed it to now they're going to ship to receiving houses that are empty, right? So 
Right. Even if something like that happens, they can go to the house and they won't find anything. Right. 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 Yeah. Because, because further nobody got in trouble for the steroids that were sent because nobody possessed those. Right. So no, that right. wasn't a part of the, that wasn't a part of the charge. The charge was just what they found in the girl's house, mm-hmm. um, which wasn't much. Yeah, because they didn't sign for it. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. No. Nobody. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody possessed it. So those were just that. You know. So again, it's. So I, so then I started having these receiving houses. So I put a receiving house in the middle and, you know, realizing the mistake I made. So we just kept going and things got bigger, better and, and, and larger. And, but it turns out that there was an operation, operation cyber juice was uh, an operation Ah. specifically to, to bust these types of operations. And the feds did pick it up later and it took them about two and a half years of investigating to, to find us okay. and they and so I, I guess i can go into so i eventually i moved i moved to new jersey but it was the greater new york city area so it was on the right on the hudson i lived in this penthouse that overlooked manhattan mm-hmm. right on the hudson it was beautiful and um i was there one day and i think i'd just gotten back from a lavish trip to vegas so i was still kind of hung over um and <laughs> At five in the morning, I heard this like pounding on the door and my dog started barking and, and I just, I almost couldn't believe what I was hearing. And, uh, and so I'm like, is somebody knocking on the door? My girlfriend at the time, you know, got up and started to go out there. So I got up and slowly put on, put on a shirt, put on some pants and I heard it again, this pounding on the door. And I'm just like, okay. and it started to make me mad. Right? I'm like, All right, I'm about yeah, to go course, there and yeah. show this, tell this person not to knock on my pound on my door at five in the morning. <laughs> so I'm out there and then, and she was already out there and she comes back and she goes, I can't see through the peephole. Like somebody's blacking it. And I was just mad. And I was just like, Oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to about to go tell them what's up. So I go to the door and I throw it open and there's like 15 cops in bulletproof vests <laughs> with guns pointed at my head, DEA all over. And they, they um, make a spectacle. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it's like, it's like, okay, you got me like, and that's kind of like the, the lead guy was that post office, like, because they assigned a post office inspector, which is a federal employee to, to, um, uh, I I guess like investigate this. And he was the one who got it taken up by operation cyber juice. Uh, and he was the guy in front, right? So he and so he had been chasing me for the entire like two and a half years. This was like his baby. And he like, I don't know, he just like put his hand on the door and he was like, okay. Okay, um, just okay, kind of telling me, okay, we got you. And also telling the guys behind him, like, okay, everything's fine here. You know, I if they researched me at all, they would say I'm not violent, I don't have guns. Or like, there was really unnecessary mm-hmm. to bring the brigade like that. But anyways, um, yeah, they just they took us both into the house. They handcuffed us and put us on on these stools. And then the first thing, the officer was like, "Do you know why we're here?" <laughs> I'm like, I'm "Like, I have no idea." <laughs> and uh, and then the next thing is they were like, like, "They didn't reach your rights." I'm trying to think if they did at that point. I don't. They did it sometime. I don't remember when though. <laughs> but but the the thing was like all the cops come in and I had this penthouse with floor to ceiling windows overlooking Manhattan. And they were all like, this is a really nice house. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks. Thanks, man. <laughs> it was kind of, uh, I don't know. For some reason, I took a little bittersweet in that moment. Like these, <laughs> I don't know. But that was, yeah. Uh, yeah and then that was it. Hmm. I guess that's the six and a half years. Um, I did, I did my time in, I did my time in federal prisons. I just did camps though. So because I was nonviolent, so. Uh, yeah. just federal camps. It wasn't not like you see in the movies where all where it's there's all this violence and everything. It's not like that. The camps aren't. <laughs> no, it, it really depends on which prison system you sit in, of course. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure there's violent prisons in, in the USA, but that's yeah. where all the, the crazy the loonies go. Yeah. You know, the right. violent not in, the, not in the 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 low level uh camps. Like we didn't even have cells so or fences. Said- you probably sat with all the guys that uh, committed tax fraud and uh, all the yeah, bookies. Yeah. And- <laughs> so there's a lot of my, my crime. So um, it's a great place to learn about business. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I did. I did. <laughs> and um, the, interestingly enough, selling cocaine is 
is not a white collar offense. Selling steroids is considered a white collar offense. So I got, I did, I got put in a white collar, like a predominantly white collar prison with all like, just like, oh, really? a lot of business guys with tax fraud and, and all kinds of, you know, fraud. Yeah. million dollar, like multi-million dollar fraud charges. And things so like, like that. you put like all these people who are very money smart, you put them together in a think tank. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> It's like the best, yeah. the best fucking uh, uh, mastermind you can be a part of. Yeah, when I think about I, it, I wrote the the business plan for my current clinic while I was in there, and I, <laughs> I had the help of I had the help of some of the venture capitalists that were in there. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> well, at least you're doing it legit now, right? Yeah. So you don't have yes, to look over would. your shoulder. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I so like a, a lot of that story, like I, I tell that story just to tell that. Uh, that it's this is more of a did story. You, you, well, one question though. Yeah. One question though. Is your TRT clinic named Matrix? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It's not. I mean, if, I mean the the name recognition, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> I I sort of thought of that. I just I I try to like uh, again with the compartmentalizing. I try to compartmentalize my story in the TRT clinic so that I don't yeah. you know, mesh the two. Uh, right. You know, I hope none of your clients find this podcast then, though. Well, the, the thing is, the ironic thing is that most people come to my clinic because of my story. And it, and they say, well, that guy knows what he's doing. And so when I started this, I didn't, I tried to keep it more compartmentalized because I didn't know how people would react to that. Mm. But the fact is, and, and that's, again, why I tell this story, just to also say that it's a story of redemption, because... I learned so much. I had so much experience. Like uh, I aggregated more empirical data than than any physician, uh, um, yeah. your, mm -hmm. your, your, a urologist, a endocrinologist, almost anybody in the entire country could have, unless they had a history like mine, where I was just guiding. Yeah. I guided a hundred new, almost a hundred new people a day for five years. Um, yeah, and 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 the thing that kept you in the business now you're doing through a clinic, so it's mm -hmm. legitimate. Yeah. And everything is prescribable and then, you know, pharmaceutical grade or through the compounding pharmacies. So you're still doing what you like to do yeah. maybe in a different setup. That's exactly correct. Like, it, I'm doing what I'm passionate about and, and just doing it legitimately mm -hmm. now. So, yeah, again, it's a story of redemption. It comes to um, I took everything I learned, which was an extensive amount and and, mm -hmm. and you know, doing it legitimately and and safely with a with a with an eye on health and safety and and long term Again, long-term safety in mind. Right, right. Did did some of your former uh, um, uh, clients move to the TRT clinic? That's interesting. Like, recognized in there. I I have. I've had a couple of guys who came to me that uh -huh. said that they did use Matrix back in the day. I have had a. That's. I've had a that's couple of guys. Cool. Yeah. So you're basically okay. You took a six year, six year break, and yeah. now you're guiding the same people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. cool, man. So you don't have to feel too guilty for uh, for you know you know disappearing on all these people because yeah. the operation when you got arrested the operation stopped, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they got everybody. They they indicted twelve people at the same time throughout the whole country. Oh wow! Oh, they were thorough. Yeah. They, yeah. They, yeah. It was a. It was a. It was a thorough. Uh, yeah. Thoroughly executed. Did you uh, end up going to Rick Collins? As your no, one lawyer? of my one of my co defendants used him, though. But okay. uh, but I I didn't I I I don't know. I got this local guy who turned out to be terrible. I was actually sentenced to about two more years than I should have been, and I mm -hmm. it, you know because of that, while I was in prison, I I actually learned the law and I wrote my own appeals. I took my own case to the Supreme Court, and then mm -hmm. I started because I had experience now with my own case and I learned the law a little bit. I started being able to help other people around me. And the next thing I know, I became what they call a jailhouse lawyer, where I'm just helping. <laughs> I'm helping because there's tons of people with legal problems in prison. So yeah. I was helping people write um, habeas corpus petitions, write motions to the court, you know, mm -hmm. defend all these things. I started helping hundreds of people around me. Um, so you're kind of like me, right? When you, once you start helping people, you can't stop. Yeah, right. Exactly. And you, you know yeah. what? To yeah. be honest, like at first I was just, I was just helping some people, but then it became something that got me well respected and well well liked by everybody because mm -hmm. if you have a, a any if you have a legal problem or even a problem with the administration so people get in trouble while they're in prison and mm -hmm. and i learned all the all the policies and everything there too so yeah, people knew that you come to me if you get in trouble and it, uh you know 
not only to pass the time, but it taught me about a lot about the law, it taught me about the legal system. And, uh, and, um, yeah, it, again, it, it allowed me to help a lot of people. While I was in prison. It was, it was yeah, good. that's good, man. That's yeah. good. Yeah. It certainly keeps your, you know, mind off spending several years in there. Yeah. <sighs> Man, how, how do you see this now with the with the oxandrum ban and the peptide ban, and uh, wh where do you see it going over the next couple of years? Because, I mean, it seems that they're getting more restrictive over there. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh, interesting when you have an agency. First of all, the, you know, a lot of a lot of I don't I'm not even sure what to call them, but thinkers have have opined about the agency problem. So when you have an agency. And this happens all the time with government agencies is especially when they can start acting in ways that where there are no consequences, they mm -hmm. don't necessarily start acting in the best interest of the people. They act in the best interest of the agency. Right. And, and we, and I saw this, like I started to develop these understandings because the BOP, the Bureau of prisons, which is what I was under um, while I was in mm -hmm. prison is just a, just a terrible agency that, <clears throat> that is was really kind of ran itself based on um, power and dominion over others, right? And it and they would, you know, interpret congressional law in ways that suited them. And you can start to see this with other agencies. So now you have an agency like the FDA that are almost unilaterally. They're not an agency that's supposed to regulate and create laws, but they are but you know by some of the actions that they've done even with like human growth hormone or this recent thing with peptides or the hcg they're actually mm -hmm. regulating substances when that's not what their intent is but they're but they're doing that and it can be dangerous in in that sense so yeah again when you um task a specific agency with a duty they will fulfill that duty so when you when you task this agency with regulating they will regulate and without the greater understanding or concept or even care about whether these regulations are adversely affecting the greater population or not, it, you know, mm -hmm. it just becomes a sense of duty. And then one of the things that agencies like to do is, is spread their power, right? So it's like, I don't think this is necessarily they're cognizant about this, but like, you know, we see this with the DEA. We certainly saw, I saw this with the BOP is they, they, they uh, interpret policy, interpret congressional policy in ways to increase their own power, right? And mm. exerting power and dominion by regulating substances that probably don't need regulation or, or it, you know, it keeps them relevant and it gives them more power. The DEA does this too with, um, w with especially with respect to, to testosterone replacement therapy, right? Mm. Uh, Every state has their own, it's a, it's a, we have dual sovereignty, right? And the states are supposed to decide how their, their citizens are being treated med, med, through the medical treatment. And they have policies regarding, um, regarding controlled substances, regarding um, how telemedicine is performed and what can be done by physicians from that state. Yeah, and when prescriptions are filled. And, yeah, and, right. They have they, they each have their own policies, which actually makes it pretty confusing because it's you know different states do things a little different. Tell me about it. So <laughs> when I came to the United States the first time, I had a, a doctor friend of uh, mine uh, write me scripts, and then I tried to fill them, but because he was not licensed in that state, yeah, I was not able to fill those yeah. scripts. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, what the hell's going on here? Now you need to go to uh, you know state X Y Z. It's like, but I'm in Vegas now. Yeah. Right. I don't have time to. Uh, this is like medication I need. No, yeah. you can't get it here. Yeah. I said, how do how do you Americans do it? I said, well, they're having a tough time. I said, oh, I can't yeah. Imagine. Yeah, and this is one of the problems is that it, it, there needs to be some uniformity, right? It, because there, in the age of telemedicine, like again, these agencies, they move at a glacial pace, right? With with mm -hmm. the way society is going and we're moving towards telemedicine. And, and even yeah. though they know that, they aren't making the changes necessary. Like it, it shouldn't be where where uh, somebody who lives in a different state, you have to go to a physician that has a license in that state. It should be, if I go to a physician out of state, then I know that I have to obey as a, as the patient, 
I know I have to obey by those regulations of whatever that state that physician is from. And I should be able allowed to go choose my own physician, no matter where he is in the country. You know, yeah. I should have that freedom, but you don't like you. Like, it, and it's, it, it seems it's, like the, the telemedicine, uh, how, how that works in is, is being limited. And yeah. Now you have to meet uh, the prescribing physician or, or your doctor within three months or six months. I can't yeah. remember what it was. And then I feel like you mentioned ATG has been classified as a biological, uh, which is very surprising because yeah. ATG is such a, a potent fertility medication. Um, and, and they now they're removing oxandrin, right? But compounded oxandrolone is still being uh, prescribable. Yeah. And all these peptides, which the peptides I understand because there's no clear, you know, human safety data on it. And I, I reviewed many of them on my YouTube channel and they're, it's true to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, but all it does is drive people underground yeah, and then right. they get it from, you know, and it kills business that businesses that are compounding pharmacies. I mean, tailor made and power, all these, all yeah. these compounding pharmacies. I mean, how are they going to operate when you literally take so much revenue away by banning these peptides? Yeah. Because they, you, they can still be prescribed, but they can also go after the prescribing physician or the prescribing pharmacy for prescribing something that has no clear. Uh, prescription information because the human safety trials have not been performed yeah. and then we're yeah. basing all these dosages for bpc 157 and tb 500 or uh not tb 500 was not bent but thymus and beta 4 mm -hmm. and all these other peptides right i mean we're kind of going with the animal models and it, it's worked for like bbc 157 and tb 500 it's literally life-changing for yeah. people i mean i just did a deep dive on it yeah. go through my comment section read the anecdotal reports it's insane Mm -hmm. they banned it for and, yeah, and now people don't even know where to get it crazy. because yeah if they get a lot of people got it on prescription you know from their doctors it's yeah. not possible anymore it, it's, so there are a few pharmacies that are directly knowingly denying uh the fda um so i have yeah. one, one pharmacy <laughs> i know just still sells it and said we refuse to comply with with the fda because yeah. it's ridiculous um another one of my pharmacies is a you know, I used to know the differences. There's a 503A, 503B. One of them is state yeah. regulated and the other is FDA regulated. I can't remember which ones are which now I used to know. A is FDA, B is state. Okay. So, yeah. so like, um, I, I also have a partnership with a pharmacy that's 503B, which is a state regulated one, right? And mm -hmm. and they don't, they don't necessarily have to answer to the FDA. So they're still selling peptides uh, as well. Okay. Um, what, so, what, what? <sighs> What if, what if this is hypothetical? What if you go to some Navajo reserve, right? Which doesn't comply mm -hmm. and you set up a dispensary, but a, not a dispensary for wheat, but like for a compounding pharmacy right on the border. Yeah. Right. Wouldn't that be like a huge money-making operation? I would think so. I would have to, you know, and that's, that's the other thing, like, with another thing, like these anti aging do. clinic in a Navajo reserve, you know, you got the beautiful scenery. Yeah. And if you want to do some shaman yeah. stuff, uh, you know, in your spare time, why not? Yeah. If they let you. <laughs> another thing these agencies do, though, if you find like a little loophole like that, then then they find a way to close it or they they interpret yeah. things in a way, you know, and that's a lot of how people were being put in prison that didn't necessarily need belong there is like is that they interpret actions to bend them into these broad regulatory statutes right? yeah to punish them yeah yeah just in the, like even if their actions weren't right in line they kind of bend it into it's uh, but so, so and that's what the, so what the dea is doing with testosterone is is the, like i said the states have their own laws and how to deal with it right and that's they have mm -hmm. sovereignty they have sovereignty over that over their own citizens in their own state but the dea comes along and says no, uh, we have our own rules about now, now, whether you have to comply with that, technically you don't because the state has sovereignty over that. So it's up to the states, each individual yeah. state's rules. But when you have a, a huge, powerful, uh, agency like the DEA come in and say, no, we have our own rules. We want people to do this, which is a little more restrictive. Um, a lot, most clinics tend to follow that because they don't want to deal with the headache of, of having to fight the DEA if they do get in trouble. And it's just like, but, but that's another thing is like, so the DEA, like they try to rest power as much power as they can. That's what these agencies do. Like we want to keep power in all these different areas. And so they'll do it whether or not the DEA is not supposed to create regulations about, about a medic, 
a state run medic medication, right? But they yeah, and that, that people might need to um, save their lives. Yeah, you know? it's right. not like like we're using this recreationally. We're we're okay. We're twisting the medical background a little bit, but we're not addicted to yeah. these drugs. We take them for to fulfill particular purposes. It's not like we're taking Percocets or or you know Kratom or <laughs> yeah. whatever all these drugs are that people take mostly for recreational purposes. And okay, and if you have a medical condition where you need Kratom or weed, I get it. I, yeah. I get it. You're in chronic pain. Mm -hmm. yeah, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic inflame, inflammation, it works. But mm -hmm. that's, you know, performance enhancing drugs we, we use for particular purposes to enhance our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame that they're taking that away. Well, I got news for you. In Thailand, it doesn't really matter. You can buy it over the pharmacy. Yeah, I have a compounding pharmacy here who gets all their peptides from tailor-made compounding, all legitimate, all that passed. Fantastic. Through the FDA. Yeah, I can get NAD plus IV at home. Yeah, it's not a big deal, man. I, I, it's a surprising amount of Americans exodusing to Thailand. Yeah, making the pilgrimage, and it's it's only the last two or three years. Like before, we barely had any Americans come through the muscle factory and the gyms, and yeah, and now it's 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 an alarmingly high amount. Every day, I see new Americans in the gym. That's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I I thought about that. Like, um, what you know, I, I started to kind of think about. Because I, when I was running that operation, I could run it just with a laptop and a cell phone. And yeah, I'm surprised you didn't move over here. Yeah, and I, w I was thinking about it. Many, many steroid dealers are here. Yeah, I can show I you. I can point it. you in the right direction. <laughs> a lot of shared stories there. <laughs> Most of them are in Patia, though. <laughs> <laughs> Not in Bangkok. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what was I thinking? I mean, um, if, you can, if you work online, you can live anywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, but now of course you got a TRT clinic and then optimization, so you're kind of you know. Where, where's your clinic currently? Where's that located? Do you service several states or? Yeah, so we're, we're completely virtual. Yeah, right now, um, right now I only have licenses in three states: uh, New York, mm -hmm. Vermont, and Florida. But I have like four more states on the way, and mm -hmm. and you know I'm assiduously working at at adding state licenses. Um, so, you know, obviously the goal is to treat all 50 states at some point here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going well and it's completely virtual. So um, my entity is created in Florida, um, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, Florida has uh, a history of being, um, of, of having, uh, beneficial regulatory, uh, rules regarding these types of, of businesses, right? So, so mm -hmm. our entity is created in Florida. Um, I personally live in New York. My office is in New York. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Taxes are a bit better there. Not taxes in New York are terrible. <laughs> no, but in, in Florida, I mean, oh, in I Florida, think, uh, they Las are. Vegas, Las Vegas, Texas, and Florida are yeah. the most tax In Florida they are. Yeah. But, but yeah. a lot of the reason that, that you built, that you create one of these entities out of Florida is because of the, the um, lenient regulatory uh, demands that they have on these types of businesses. It must be so hard to navigate in the UN United States when you have 50 different regulatory it is. Uh, agencies overseeing 50 different states. And then, of course, you want to market right, to everybody yeah. in America. And then, oh, you're in this state? Oh, I'm sorry. Can't yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. It's It's super difficult. And that's part of... You know, that's a part of what, you know, what I had to do is I actually, and, you know, it helped that I had a, a legal, that, that I studied a lot of the law when I was in prison, because mm -hmm. now I'm able to understand reading statutes and I'm able, I'm able to pile through them. So like for this, like the, I spent the first six months I got out just piling through all different state laws on telemedicine and on testosterone and r resolving that with the federal laws. And really figuring out, deep diving into figuring out exactly how this all works. So now, you know, now I have it pretty well understood, but, uh, but it is, Good. it's super difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, if you want to do a holiday in, in Thailand, you're always welcome to join. I can uh, show you, maybe you can get some uh, ideas. Yeah. <laughs> how things could be. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, and so that's, that's another thing. That's where I wanted to go with this. So yeah, you're yeah. absolutely correct. Like it's, it's so difficult. The, the regulations end up pushing people into the black market. 
um, mm. it's not well understood. So one of the things, one of the, um, one of the things I want to take on, uh, one of the causes I want to take on, I'm going to take on, and I've, I've already really put a lot of thought and understanding on how to make this happen. Um, especially as, as I get bigger, as my audience grows is I want to lead the charge for descheduling testosterone, especially or right? testosterone and its derivatives. Mm. And so again, when you have one of these regulatory agencies, um, and they, when they tend to do something that is, uh, you know, not in the best in interest of the people, but at first they get away with it because there's no consequences to the FDA over-regulating. There's no consequence or immediately to the DEA over-regulating. What has to happen is the people have to get together. They have to get mad. They have to get together. They have to start, um, um, uh, you know, speaking out to their state representatives, to their congressional representatives. And then, then, you know, it, it even gets so bad uh, sometimes that the president actually has to step in and, and hire somebody to, to regulate the, in a certain way. Like I remember w one instant instance was the FDA for decades was had such high regulations on pushing new medications through that it was, it was just like all these all these drug companies were actually complaining about how hard it was to get a beneficial medication through the FDA with all their insane regulations and, and red tape that you had to, that they had to pile through that the, the people started actually, you know, people in lobby groups started having to push back. And finally with Obama and Trump, mm -hmm. Trump finally put, um, I think it was Gottlieb, Scott Gottlieb, in charge of the uh, as director of the FDA to specifically to implement a faster system, um, okay. but it took decades. It's I mean it was yeah. decades of of you know how many how many of these beneficial drugs did we miss out on because the FDA you know I always like to say it like this too how many millions of people have lived and died lives of despair because the medical community doesn't understand testosterone and how beneficial it can be. Right. I mean, and over it's time, it's been millions and millions and millions of people. And I mean, it, when, you, when you start diving into the into the research and you see all these wonderful compounds that are not FDA approved and then clinical trials are canceled or abandoned. And you're like, yeah. But why? Yeah, but exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but what and are you guys so, doing? You know? Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's going to take getting the people together to to thwart these agencies the the really the only way to do it is get these people together and and like i said you you we'd have to get the our congressional members or you know the house of representatives to actually put new people in office to actually um or, or put the right people in office to actually change change the laws change the regulations so you know that's that's kind of what so that's what one of the causes that i'm going to take up is is putting an emotion leading the charge to deschedule uh, testosterone and its derivatives uh first of all and we can do that like one of the ways actually dr todd lee and i were talking and and he had a great idea um one of the ways to do that would be to like put this idea of my body my choice right i want i want to be able mm -hmm. to take testosterone if i want to take it put it under some symbol whether it be like a green ribbon or a i don't know like a little shield with swords i don't know whatever some symbol right and then mm -hmm. say and then and then start saying you know calling it my body my uh my body my choice and then mm -hmm. and then approve different congre congressmen and house of representatives and say this person is my body my choice approved right so that means vote for this person if you want to stop ah, right. Right? Yeah, 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 so then yeah. we can start yeah. and we can also and also, my business is going to start certainly putting money. We're going to create a nonprofit um, for, so people can donate to this cause. My business mm -hmm. is going to start donating money. I'm going to try to get all the other influencers. So one of these days, hopefully shortly, I'll, I'll get in contact with you to start sure. um, spreading the word about donating to My Body, My Cause. We'll put it in an escrow account with Rick Collins. When we have enough money, mm -hmm. we'll get a lobby group. Um, the lobby group to help push in our cause and then we'll get everybody understanding what what representatives to vote for in order to, mm -hmm. to put this in the place and eventually with enough people that should get testosterone to schedule it's already been talked about mainly because of the 
trans community, right? It's been talked about the scheduling testosterone. Yeah, but it's for the wrong kind of people. Right. Right. So, but <laughs> of course, like, they need it for for a different reason. They don't yeah, need it. Yet, right. But, <laughs> but, but at least at least the, it's been raised. The concept has been raised before, right? So we can just kind of push and that. It, and it's so more. funny because there's so many entrepreneurs and, and, and public figures on t testosterone replacement therapy. I mean, Jeff Bezos. That's what that, it's, yeah, was, that's what it's going to take. Like we got to get congressmen Kennedy, on testosterone. Kennedy, we have to get a president it, on testosterone so that they can say like, yeah, this is very beneficial. Well, what is this Kennedy guy called? This, this with the throw yeah. voice box, uh, what's his name? Is he uh, running? I don't know. You mean, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I forget. No, I, forget no, I forget his name. I forget his name too. He's, he's a red, he's a redhead, right? Yeah. Uh, I forget his name, but yeah, yeah I always forget like his that. name too. But he's, uh, he was in Joe Rogan and he's clearly on testosterone replacement therapy. They had a great, uh, discussion. this is what we need. Yeah. We yeah. And you're right. Yeah, or, 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 or you can cast your ultimate vote and that you renounce your nationality and you go back, pay taxes somewhere else. <laughs> and you don't have to give a shit anymore. <laughs> but that's, that's the biggest fuck you you can do to the government. <laughs> right? You have to try all other options first. <laughs> the problem is the government, like if I renounce, renounce, the government doesn't really care. But if I lead the charge to get an entire nation to, to change the way yeah. that they do something, I think like that's, that's a big fuck you to the government as well. Yeah, no, oh, especially if you can if you can get it done, you know. But I think it's only a matter of time because, yeah, you know, like with these kinds of things, the government and and most of the regulating bodies are just behind, right? yeah. And and the people Far want behind. it a certain way. Okay, now weed is slowly being acceptable yeah. and tolerated, and and Holland has been you know legalized for years, and now in Thailand and now in America and other countries are following suit, like yeah. Canada. I think it's not a big deal. So it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it will happen in our lifetime. Yeah. And then we can tell people, I said, I've been using testosterone for years. Yeah. And you guys relate to the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plus, yeah. we're then fucking experts, you know? So yeah. we, we've this is seen exactly everything. Right. Yeah. We've seen everything and done everything. I hope, I hope you're successful, man. I mean, it would be a great victory for the TRT community in the United States. And yeah. then usually other countries follow with the changes of the United States. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of a lot of the regulating bodies in other countries, they kind of look what the policy is in the U.S. regarding certain things, mm. and then if the U.S. is more lenient, then other call, uh, countries might follow suit. Yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly the plan. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's cool. Hey, thanks so much for coming on. This was very insightful. Yeah, it was very cool, guys. If you if you ever use Matrix, <laughs> let us know down below. Yeah, so I <laughs> post your post your like. A, a seven year too late review of yeah. matrix labs <laughs> so <laughs> I, I would love to see <laughs> i've had people reach out to me and say that i still have some matrix laying around and and they said, ah. that they, they said, they said that, so i've heard from a couple of people in fact when i did paul's podcast too he said people reached out to him and told him that they still had matrix laying around oh uh, that's funny yeah i know people who still have essicline and parabolin amps Oh, okay. You know, like there connoisseurs, yeah, they just keep it in there, like like a little box or a couple yeah. of angels. <laughs> you just still got it laying around. Yeah, that's really funny. Yeah, I mean, when you're when you're a connoisseur, when you're just the aficionado of this kind of stuff, of course, you know. Yeah, they, of course. <laughs> it was it was an honor to talk to you today, Steve. I've been following you for a long Thanks, time, man. and I really appreciate what you yeah, do. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Keep me posted. Where can people find you uh, on uh, online? So I'm at hormonesforme.com. I um, maybe I'll give you a link and we, we can link to hormones. Yeah, I'll just post them down below. Okay, yeah, hormonesforme.com, and I I also have a, a YouTube channel, and I actually have a book out too where I that actually came out really good. Um, I'm not done okay. with it yet, but it's um, it's in serialized chapters that you can read mm -hmm. it online on the the Amazon Vela. It's called Memori okay. Memoirs of a Steroid Kingpin. There um, you go. And it's, it actually came out really good. Like I was, you know, the whole time I was in prison, honestly, I started like, I started to kind of write it in my head and I kind of mm -hmm. knew how I wanted to do it. And when I got out, somebody said that they wanted to pay for the rights for the story for me to write it. So okay. I started writing it and I got like 15 chapters in. it's not done yet, but, um, but you can read what is done. Uh, and I can, I can give you the link for that too. Memoirs of a story. Yeah, please. Yeah. So when it's done, there will eventually be a movie. I, I hope so. So I did have a, 
I did have someone that was doing a documentary and they started it okay. and we even have a credit on IMDB, but with this director, something happened and, um, he had to, he had to something with his family happened. So he had to mm. pull out of it for now. I don't know if we're going to start it again, but we did have a, a, a documentary going. Maybe maybe you can reach out to Ken Kanakin, who's the organizer of Swiss Symposium. Well, I'll send you the details. Yeah, so send me the details. That would be I would. So there was a, a whole group of guys there. Uh, we're doing a stereo documentary, and me and Chase Irons got interviewed. And I'm not sure what the what the status of that is. Uh, but they were very very happy with me and mine my transparency and chase's transparency and i think yeah. they would love your transparency too okay. so i'll put you in touch i would love that because uh, they would they were they were really going after the raw the raw stories yeah uh, so i'm sure you can make an appearance there yes yeah. they're uh, they're really putting the, their legs forward on, uh, on that kind of stuff did you go to the mr olympia this year or no i i didn't go this year so i'm still mm -hmm. on probation and it was just a pain to get oh, okay. permission yeah. to go down there. I went in 2012 and 13, though. But it's um, a while back. Yeah. What about this year? Uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't end up going this year, though. <clears throat> no, but what about this year? If you're, it's oh, in Las the, Vegas. This what? coming year, yeah. Especially if, a, yeah, yeah. I yes, I would. I would love to go. Yeah. In fact, I think I'll make right. a point to go. Yeah, well, I might come there, depending oh, on yeah. how pregnant my wife is around that time. Yeah, I might book a last minute, um, but I, I'm doing my absolute best to show up again because the yeah. Olympia is a lot of fun. And it's in Vegas, so that's even more fun. It, it was in Orlando this year. Yeah, yeah, I was there also. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. that's why I figured maybe you were walking around there too and I was walking there. Oh, we yeah. miss each other. Yeah, I'll definitely, <laughs> I'll definitely have to say hi. Yeah, I'd like to make it a point to go this year. Cool. Hope to see you there then. Hope yeah. we can both make it. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on, man. This was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. And I'll talk to you again soon. It was an honor for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take, take care, buddy. Peace. Bye.